R. E. Lee, A Biography, Volume 3, Chapters 12 through 17. Written by Douglas Southall Freeman. Published by Charles Scribner's Sons, New York and London, 1934. Digitalization by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI neural voice. Chapter 12 A Sacrificed Christmas. Lee came back to his headquarters at Orange Courthouse to find other reason for distress than the escape of Meade unpunished from Mine Run. The public prints were full of alarming news from Tennessee. All that had been achieved at Chickamauga had been undone. Instead of flanking the position at Chattanooga, as Lee had recommended, Bragg had waited in front of the town until he had been driven off by the incredible federal assaults on Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge, November 2325, 1863. Bragg, the papers reported, had retreated to Dalton, where he had been relieved of command. So fraught with possible disaster was this sudden turn of events that Lee put aside his habitual reserve and wrote the president on December 3rd a serious letter of direct advice. Prefacing his proposals with the statement that his information was based solely on newspaper reports, he pointed out that the enemy might penetrate into Georgia and get possession of our depots of provisions and important manufactories. As tactfully as he could, he suggested that Beauregard be put at the head of the Army of Tennessee and that troops be drawn from Mobile, from Mississippi, and from Charleston to strengthen the threatened line of federal advance. Then he laid down this general strategic policy, I think that every effort should be made to concentrate as large a force as possible under the best commander to ensure the discomfiture of Grant's army. To do this and gain the great advantage that would accrue from it, the safety of points practically less important than those endangered by his army must be hazarded. Upon the defense of the country threatened by General Grant depends the safety of the points now held by us on the Atlantic, and they are in as great danger from his successful advance as by the attacks to which they are at present directly subjected. This was a clear forecast of the strategy the federal government was to employ in the Southern Campaign of 1864, when Sherman's march to the sea sounded the final doom of the Confederacy. Lee plainly saw in December, 1863, the probability of what was to happen in December, 1864, and as far as he could he sought to prevent it by an immediate concentration. The answer to this letter came in a brief telegram two days later, could you consistently go to Dalton, as heretofore explained? Davis asked. Lee did not want to make the exchange of commands. He did not feel that he had the physical strength to undertake an active campaign with a demoralized army in an unfamiliar country. Something deep within him shrank from facing the bickerings and jealousies that had been inflamed in the Army of Tennessee. He doubted if he would have the cooperation of the corps and division commanders, and he did not believe that his temporary presence with them would yield any substantial result. What was needed was an able, permanent commander who knew the officers and had the vigor to suppress their rivalries. Besides, if he left the Army of Northern Virginia, a new leader would have to be assigned to it, for Ewell was too feeble to direct it. All this Lee set forth, frankly on December 7, in a reply to the President. I hope, he concluded, Your Excellency will not suppose that I am offering any obstacles to any measure you may think necessary. I only seek to give you the opportunity to form your opinion after a full consideration of the subject. I have not that confidence either in my strength or ability as would lead me of my own option to undertake the command in question. It seemed as if the president were determined to act, for on December 9 Lee received a summons to Richmond. Lee assumed that Mr. Davis would permit him to return to the Rapidan long enough to put his official business in order, but he interpreted the brief message to mean that he was to be ordered to the far south. At that prospect, the affection Lee had formed for the Army of Northern Virginia asserted itself with the pang a man feels when he is forced to tear up his life by the very roots. In a hurried note to Stuart, he bade him seek positions for the cavalry where they could be foraged and would not be too far from the enemy. My heart and thoughts will always be with this army, he said, but there he stopped. His was not a nature to sentimentalize. By way of the worn and creaking Virginia Central Railroad, Lee departed that same day, December 9. Arriving in Richmond, he left the train under the shadow of the hill where the Confederate Congress was then sitting, and went uptown, through troubled streets, to quarters Mrs. Lee had rented on Lee Street between 2nd and 3rd.
They were in a two-story wooden house, a humble place compared with Arlington, but the first home of their own in which the members of the family had been able to gather since the outbreak of the war. As Lee sat down for the first time in this new abode, he must have heard many stories of the wanderings of the family during the exciting months when he could only keep in touch with them by hurried letters that often were delayed and sometimes went astray. After the sojourn in North Carolina, Mildred Lee remained at school in Raleigh during the winter of 1862-1863, and Mary Lee, the eldest daughter, spent most of her time at Cedar Grove, the plantation of Dr. and Mrs. Richard Stewart, in King George County. Mrs. Lee and Agnes went to Richmond that same winter and were the guests of Mr. and Mrs. James Caskey at the southeast corner of 11th and Clay. Here General Lee visited them when he came to the capital, and here he formed the acquaintance of the charming Norval Caskey, the young daughter of the house, who was one of Agnes's most intimate friends and soon became one of the general's most admired circle. For Christmas, 1862, most of the family went from Richmond to Hickory Hill. Although Mrs. Lee's arthritis was then severe, she insisted on making the deserts and went into the basement kitchen for that pursue, but without complete success, for Grandfather Williams Wickham, accustomed to bountiful living, privately confided that she had been too sparing with the sugar. From Hickory Hill, the family returned to the Caskies in Richmond and remained there until some time after June 9, 1863, when the mother, Agnes, and Mildred went again to Hickory Hill. They were on that fine old estate when the Federal raiders captured Rooney Lee and carried him off to Fort Monroe. The shock of this gloomy affair and the spread of her infection so crippled Mrs. Lee that she could only move about on crutches. In the belief that a visit to the mineral baths would help in restoring her health, plans were made to carry her to one of the Virginia spas. Agnes and Mildred were to accompany their mother, and as Charlotte Wickham Lee was also in bad health, through excessive grief over her wounded husband, it was decided to take her, also, and to let her choose the resort. She selected the hot springs in Allegheny County. About July 15, Mrs. Lee journeyed to Ashland, spent two days in the company of her old neighbor, Mrs. John P. McGuire, and then started for the resort in a boxcar fitted up as a bedroom. The vacation was not successful. Charlotte's condition grew worse and Mrs. Lee's was not bettered. The food was so poor at the springs that the guest entered a formal protest, especially against the bread. After Mrs. Lee came back to Richmond, she took the house on Lee Street late in October. There was room for Agnes and for Mildred, but space was so limited that Charlotte had to find quarters on Fifth Street, near Cary, half a mile from her mother-in-law. The City Council of Richmond took cognizance of the family's embarrassment in the crowded capital and proposed to buy a home and present it to the general, but as soon as he heard of the resolution, he wrote a grateful letter asking that the project be dropped and that the city devote to the families of soldiers whatever surplus funds it might have available. Prompt as Lee was to decline this offer, he was nonetheless grateful for it and for the multitude of courtesies shown his family. The kindness exhibited toward you as well as myself by our people, he wrote Mrs. Lee, causes me to reflect how little I have done to merit it, and humbles me in my own eyes to a painful degree. In the little house on Lee Street there was satisfaction over the small comforts the family could enjoy from its own resources, and much pride, at least on Agnes's part, that when company came to dine, there were enough glasses to go around. But there were griefs enough, too. Mrs. Lee's condition was definitely worse, and though she still talked bravely of what she would do when she could walk again, she could not get about even with the aid of her crutches and had to use a rolling chair. Rooney's plight was a constant grief to the family, and not least to his father. Lee had viewed the capture of his second son as a dispensation of providence and had sought to comfort Charlotte with the assurance that her husband would be well cared for. At first, this had been done. Rooney had been placed in the hospital at Fort Monroe and had been allowed liberties on his assurance that he would not attempt to escape while there, but on July 15 he had been ordered into close confinement and had been threatened with death by hanging if the Confederate authorities executed Captain W. H. Sawyer and Captain John M. Flynn. These two Federals had been selected by lot from among the officers confined in Libby Prison and were under sentence in retaliation for the killing of Captain T. G. McGraw and William F. Corbin, C. S. A., who had been caught as spies within the Federal lines in Kentucky. Lee never believed in retaliation, but apparently he made no effort to intervene in Rooney's behalf. The Federal threat, however, had been effective in preventing the execution of Sawyer and Flynn, and that doubtless saved Rooney's life though he had been kept a close prisoner for some weeks. 
As all exchanges had been suspended, Lee had no idea when he would be released, but for a time was hopeful of an early exchange. The restraints on Rooney were gradually relaxed until he received so much attention from friends and visitors at Fort Monroe that the authorities decided to send him to Johnson's Island, where he would not be lionized. Fortunately for him, the orders were modified to permit his transfer to Fort Lafayette, for which place he left Fort Monroe on November 13. Lee told his family that this was a gain, inasmuch as any place would be better than Fort Monroe, with Butler in command. He added, his long confinement is very grievous to me, yet it may all turn out for the best. While Lee was in Richmond, Rooney was definitely placed on the same status as other prisoners, and the worst was over, so far as he was concerned. But Charlotte's condition became daily more serious. All her vitality seemed to be gone. There was a third sorrow to the family, one of which few outsiders had more than vague hints. Agnes Lee had a handsome second cousin, named William Orton Williams, son of a West Point graduate, Captain William G. Williams, who had been killed in the Battle of Monterey during the Mexican War. Orton, as he was known to the family, had been in the United States Army as a lieutenant of the 2nd Cavalry on the outbreak of hostilities in 1861 and had joined the South. He had been an aide to General Leonidas Polk, and then had served as Assistant Chief of Artillery to General Bragg. At Shiloh, he had much distinguished himself. He had come to Virginia at Christmas time, 1862, and had visited Agnes at Hickory Hill. His Christmas presents, a riding whip and a pair of gauntlets, had been among her treasured gifts. They had ridden together, and he had made his addresses to her, but had been rejected. Orton was much too fond of drink, and his failure to win Agnes's hand, coupled with other disappointments and entanglements, made him reckless. He procured assignment to a secret mission, probably in Canada or in Europe, and to conceal his identity was commissioned Colonel of Cavalry under the name of Lawrence W. Orton. On June 8, 1863, attended by his cousin, Captain Walter G. Peter, and clad in federal uniform, he rode into the Union lines at Franklin, Tennessee. With forged appears, he introduced himself as Colonel Orton and his companion as Major Dunlap. They had come, he said, with special instructions to examine all posts. Although they seemed little interested in the matters that spies would usually study, their actions aroused suspicion. They were detained for the verification of their passes, and when these were declared spurious, they were arrested, tried by drumhead court-martial, and executed early on the morning of June 9, 1863. Before they were hanged, the men confessed their identity but maintained they were not spies, a statement in which the commandant at Franklin joined. They were, at least, not ordinary spies, he reported, and had some mission more important than finding out my situation. Said they were going to Canada and something about Europe, not clear. We found on the memorandum of commanding officers and assistant adjutant generals in northern states. Though they admitted the justice of the sentence and died like soldiers, they would not disclose their true object. Their conduct was very singular indeed, I can make nothing of it. In the few hours allowed him before he was executed, Williams wrote a brief note to his sister, Martha, known in the family as Marky. He said, Do not believe that I am a spy. With my dying breath I deny the charge. Do not grieve too much for me. Although I die a horrid death I will meet my death with the fortitude becoming the son of a man whose last words to his children were, tell them I died at the head of my column. A copy of this message was sent by Marky to Agnes. Little was said of the affair in the family, but there was grief at this tragic end of a friend and a kinsman. General Lee had always been interested in Orton and, at Marky's request, in 1853 he had given much thought to the choice of a school for the boy. He was outraged now at the execution of the young man. Although he did not write to Marky for fear his letter might raise suspicion against her in Georgetown, where she still resided, he kept her grief in his heart. Three years later he was to say, My blood boils at the thought of the atrocious outrage against every manly and Christian sentiment which the great God alone is able to forgive. Custis Lee was unhappy, too. His brothers and his kinsmen had been in nearly all the great battles of the Army of Northern Virginia, he had occupied a sheltered position as one of the president's aides, a post of honor, yet not to his liking. 
His great desire was to see field service, but his keen conscience made him feel that he should not undertake it without experience, nor did either he or his father consider that they should ask for a transfer from the president's staff. Custis lived at the time with a group of other staff officers in a large house on Franklin Street, and his constant duties gave him little opportunity of seeing his family, but his state of mind was of course familiar to them and his discontent with his position was a family distress. Still another shadow hung over the household. Under a law passed by Congress in June, 1862, as amended February 6, 1863, direct taxes had been levied on real estate in the insurrectionary districts within the United States and commissioners had been named to assess and collect these taxes. The commissioners had been empowered, in case of default, to sell the property, and as the aim of the act was, in effect, to expropriate the holdings of southern men in occupied territory, the officials held to the rule that they would only accept payment from the owners in person. On behalf of the Lees, their cousin, Philippa Fendel, tendered the taxes imposed on Arlington, $92, with a penalty of 50%. The commissioners refused to receive the money and were preparing to issue a tax title to the United States. The old home, the center of life of the family, was about to be lost, for delinquent taxes in theory, by confiscation in fact. Thus, when Lee came home that evening of December 9, he realized how heavily the war had smitten his family, their home had been lost, Mrs. Lee was almost helpless in her invalidism, one son was in prison, the general's brilliant firstborn was unhappy because of his assignment, one daughter was dead in a far-off cemetery, another had been touched by tragedy, and his only daughter-in-law was not far from death. Lee himself, who had entered the struggle in the full vigor of robust manhood, was aging hourly, his hair and beard white, and that sharp, paroxysmal pain intermittently wrenching his left side. But there was little time to dwell on family woes, even had Lee been of a nature to yield to them. The question that had brought him to Richmond, the question of whether he should undertake a new campaign on strange terrain, had to be discussed in long conferences with the president, and a multitude of details concerning the army had to be handled with railroad officials and with the chiefs of the bureaus of the War Department. Lee remained willing to assume the difficult task in Georgia, if the president thought it proper to send him there. In talking with Senator B. H. Hill, he said simply, I have no ambition but to serve the Confederacy and do all I can to win our independence. I am willing to serve in any capacity to which the authorities may assign me. But he held to his belief that others could accomplish more with the Army of Tennessee than he could hope to do, and when he found the president indisposed to name Beauregard to succeed Bragg, as he had originally advised, it seems probable that he urged the appointment of General Johnston to the command. There was some delay in a decision, while Mr. Davis waited for information from the Southwest, but by about the 15th it was settled that Lee would not be ordered to Dalton. On December 16, Johnston was assigned to the post, with instructions to reorganize the army and to prepare for an offensive as soon as practicable. Lee is not known to have said anything publicly of this appointment, but it undoubtedly was not only a relief to him, but a satisfaction also, for his faith in the ability of Joseph E. Johnston had not been impaired by that officer's failure to relieve Vicksburg. Lee could go back to his beloved army, and Johnston, he trusted, could keep the Federals from invading Georgia. In the midst of the conferences that led to this conclusion, Lee received as much of attention and of honor in Richmond as his nature would permit. The Confederate House of Representatives passed a resolution inviting him to have a seat on the floor, and when he went to worship at St. Paul's Church on December 13, a silent ovation must have been given him after the service as he walked slowly down the aisle, bowing to friends and acquaintances, right and left. The President took advantage of his presence to get his judgment on the work recently done on the city's fortifications. With General Elsey and some members of Mr. Davis's staff, they made a tour of inspection on December 15. General Avril was on another of his raids at the time. Knowing their chief's dislike of unconfirmed rumors, the officers at Lee's headquarters were loath to forward him all the stories that came in concerning the move. Lee learned enough to make him anxious to return to the army and do what he could in trapping the troublesome Union cavalrymen, but the Federal contrived to get quickly away after burning the station and the supplies at Salem, Virginia. There was, consequently, no special reason why Lee should hurry back to the Rapidan, and there were numerous personal reasons why he should spend Christmas with his family, the first time it had been possible since 1859. Robert had come to Richmond, Charlotte was very ill, the enemy was quiet on the Rapidan. Why should he not remain?
At Lee's camp, his aides were asking the same question and were not envious of his good fortune. But they knew the man and were uncertain whether he would stay at the capital. It will be more in accordance with his peculiar character, Major Walter Taylor confided to his sweetheart, if he leaves for the army just before the great anniversary, he is so very apt to suppress or deny his personal desire when it conflicts with the performance of his duty. Taylor's judgment was not an error, for the next day, December 21st, Lee appeared in camp. He had deliberately sacrificed his Christmas to set an example of obedience to duty. It was a gloomy Christmas he had in his tent. Oppressed by Mrs. Lee's condition and by Charlotte's illness, he was acutely conscious, also, of the distress of the country people round about him. When some of the foreign observers came to visit him during the day, he could not forbear reference to the plight of the poor families living in the devastated area, and the one touch of feeling he ever exhibited toward the enemy, his oft-recurring resentment at the atrocities inflicted on non-combatants, showed itself as he recounted how the enemy seemed determined to burn and to harass even when the country was so barren that the southern army could not hope to draw supplies from it. Captain Ross, one of the attaches, remarked that Arlington had been treated in the same way. But Lee interrupted him quickly. That I can easily understand, he said, and for that I don't care, but I do feel sorry for the poor creatures I see here, starved and driven from their homes for no reason whatsoever. The news from Charlotte had been somewhat more encouraging, and on the 26th Lee was hopeful that she might recover, but that evening he received from Custis a telegram announcing her death. Lee's affection for Charlotte was as deep as that for his own children, yet he received the sad intelligence of her death with the spirit of resignation he always displayed. It has pleased God, he said, to take from us one exceedingly dear to us, and we must be resigned to his holy will. She, I trust, will enjoy peace and happiness forever while we must patiently struggle on under all the ills that may be in store for us. What a glorious thought it is that she has joined her little cherubs and our angel Annie in heaven. Thus is link by link the strong chain broken that binds us to earth, and our passage soothed to another world. Oh, that we may be at last united in that heaven of rest, where trouble and sorrow never enter, to join in an everlasting chorus of praise to our Lord and Saviour. I grieve for our lost darling as a father only can grieve for a daughter, and my sorrow is heightened by the thought of the anguish her death will cause our dear son and the poignancy it will give to the bars of his prison. May God in his mercy enable him to bear the blow he has so suddenly dealt and sanctify it to his everlasting happiness. With that prayer, he approached the end of 1863 while the bones of the dead bleached on Cemetery Ridge and slow starvation crept along the coast. Chapter 13, Lee as a Diplomatist The Winter of 1863-1864 The first three months of 1864 were spent in a routine similar in many particulars to that which Lee had taken up after Burnside's mud march in the winter of 1862-1863. From his headquarters in a wood on the southern slope of Clark's Mountain, Lee rode daily with Major Venable or Major Marshall or both to study some part of his long line of twenty miles. As far as practicable, he kept the infantry in sheltered camps and entrusted picketing to the cavalry. This was not easy. When forage was at its lowest some of the mounted regiments had to ride forty miles to their posts, but there seemed no other way of protecting the front. Large units of infantry could not be posted at each fort because it would weaken the army too greatly. Small forces, Lee reasoned, could easily be cut off. On February 6, the Federals crossed in strength at Norton's Ford, remained all day and returned that night to the North Bank, a mere demonstration, Lee thought, only intended to see where we were and whether they could injure us. On February 22, Lee went to Richmond to confer with the president on the military outlook and while there, breakfasting at the White House, was given a lecture on strategy by an Alabama senator. He smiled blandly the while, Mrs. Chestnut noted in her diary, though he did permit himself a mild sneer at the wise civilians in Congress who refrained from trying the battlefield in person but from afar dictated the movements of armies. Lee spent much time with the President and with General Bragg, who had come to Richmond to act as Mr. Davis's adviser. The visit was interrupted on February 29 by the news that General Kilpatrick and Colonel Ulrich Dahlgren had launched a long-expected raid on Richmond. Lee passed up the railroad only a few hours before Dahlgren struck it, and once again he narrowly escaped capture.
He immediately organized an expedition into Madison County to meet a diversion incident to the main raid, but this served no other purpose than to expose the men, unsheltered, to freezing weather and to a snowstorm. Dahlgren and Kilpatrick were repulsed at the Richmond defenses, and Dahlgren himself was later killed in King and Queen County. On his body was found an address to his soldiers, directing that the prisoners in Richmond be released, that the city be burned, and that President Davis and his cabinet be killed. This paper created an immense stir and, later in the spring, prompted General Lee to make formal inquiry of General Meade as to the authenticity of the document. These were the only operations of importance in northern and central Virginia until Grant opened the Wilderness Campaign in May, 1864. Numerous warnings from the Lower Peninsula of an expedition against Richmond caused Lee to urge the further strengthening of the defenses of that city and of Petersburg. He speculated, also, whether this new, anticipated advance on the capital would proceed or follow the opening of the campaign in northern Virginia. An abortive advance in North Carolina was made on New Bern, February 1-2, at the instance of General R. F. Hoke and with the approval of Lee. After this failure, Lee was anxious to recall Hoke, but that officer justified delay by the brilliant capture of Plymouth on April 20, with approximately 2,500 prisoners, for which exploit he was promoted Major General. Insignificant as were these affairs compared with the great battles of the preceding years, there was abundant work for General Lee at headquarters, work as difficult as that of open campaigning, work that called for qualities the lack of which has made many an able field commander a mere name in dusty reports. Lee the strategist had to be Lee the diplomatist. Many of the best officers were dead, notably Jackson and Pender. Others had been incapacitated or had sustained crippling wounds. Some had heartburnings and a sense of failure. Lack of promotion rankled the spirits of not a few. In the artillery, Gettysburg had shown that certain of the older men were incompetent and by their seniority were blocking the promotion of younger, more scientific gunners. There were in some cases distinct problems of difficult personality or dangerous dislikes. All these were aggravated by a long, cold winter of idleness. It was Lee's task to remove the incompetent, to promote the deserving, to humble the arrogant, to suit the sensibilities of the disappointed, and to prepare the command once again for the cruel exactions of what might be the decisive campaign. The means he employed to these ends are worthy of examination in some detail. The assignment of new officers to brigade and divisional command had been underway since the close of the Gettysburg Campaign. The most important position to fill had been that of a successor to General Pender. On August 1, Lee had recommended Brigadier General Cadmus M. Wilcox, whom he described as one of the oldest brigadiers in the service, a highly capable officer who deserved promotion. To succeed Pettigrew, he had chosen W. W. Kirkland, who had been Colonel of the 21st North Carolina, in Hoke's Brigade, and in the place of the fallen Sems he had selected Good Bryan, Colonel of the 16th Georgia, Wofford's Brigade. Perrin had been given McGowan's old brigade, temporarily, John Pegram had been assigned to that formerly led by William Smith. In the absence of Rooney Lee, the able John R. Chambliss was named to head his command, and in March, 1864, Brigadier General N. H. Harris was designated to handle the brigade of Carnot Posey, who had died on November 13, 1863, of wounds received at Bristow Station. All these promotions were made without arousing many open jealousies. The only exception of consequence was Colonel Edward A. O'Neill of the 26th Alabama. After Rhodes's promotion to Major General, a new commander for his brigade had been necessary, and Lee had recommended O'Neill, then the senior colonel. For some reason, O'Neill's commission had been delayed, but he had been in charge of the brigade at Gettysburg, where, on the first day, he had not distinguished himself. Lee did not censure O'Neill or bring him before a court of inquiry, but quietly recommended three other Alabama colonels in preference to him. Colonel Cullen A. Battle was chosen. This much incensed O'Neill, who subsequently applied for the transfer of his regiment to the army under General Polk. That, however, was not the end of the matter. In the spring of 1864, Senator James Phelan of Alabama, the same gentleman who had lectured Lee on strategy at the White House, protested to Mr. Davis that injustice had been done Colonel O'Neill, and Davis forwarded the papers to Lee. Lee prepared a detailed answer, in which he stated that if the military situation permitted, he would like a court of inquiry in the case.
Then he went on, I concur with the Honble. Mr. Phelan that Colonel O'Neill is a most true, brave, and gallant officer. Still I believe that Culls, Gordon, Morgan, and Battle gave promise of making better brigade commanders and therefore recommended them before him. The regiment of Colonel O'Neill has been transferred. I am unable to compare his qualifications with those of the officers of the Alabama regiments mentioned by Mr. Phelan and cannot say whether he is the best commander that can be selected for a brigade composed of those regiments. If he is, I should be gratified at his promotion. Later on, when O'Neill's troops returned to Virginia and a brigade's commission for him reached headquarters, Lee sent it back with endorsement of another officer and the simple comment, Since my first letter to His Excellency I have seen Colonel O'Neill and have made more particular inquiries into his capacity to command the brigade and I cannot recommend him to the command. In making these and all other promotions, Lee was mindful not only of valor and leadership displayed on the field, but of discipline maintained in camp and on the march. He came one day upon a cavalry brigade halted in a lane adjoining a field of ripe watermelons. All the troopers except those of one regiment were dismounted and were devouring the melons. Lee sent for the colonel of the regiment that had not been allowed to enter the field. Why, he asked blandly, were not those men helping themselves to the melons that were so abundant? My men, general, the colonel answered, are not allowed to disobey your orders concerning pillaging. Lee said no more and rode on. As it happened, several of the colonels of that brigade had been recommended for promotion. When the time came to make the award, Lee gave it to the colonel who had obeyed orders. Equal stress he always placed upon the temperance of those who were considered for high command. I cannot, he said, place in control of others one who cannot control himself. The promotions in the artillery caused much concern and called for the full measure of Lee's diplomacy. He seems to have been guided largely by the judgment of General Pendleton, who prepared a full and lengthy memorandum on the qualifications of the various corps chiefs and battalion commanders. In carrying out Pendleton's recommendations, Lee took good care that older officers like Colonel J. B. Walton of the First Corps should not have their sensibilities offended by transfers, and he was willing to forego the personal convenience of retaining as capable an assistant as Colonel A. L. Long on his staff in order that Long might have higher rank and the Second Corps the advantage of his services as its chief of artillery. Lee was much embarrassed in many cases by the policy of the administration which yielded to the demand that brigade officers should come from the same states as their troops. Governor Vance of North Carolina, who visited the Army in March, 1864, and made a number of speeches that Lee enjoyed greatly, was particularly insistent that his state be recognized. To satisfy him, Lee put the North Carolina Cavalry under General L. S. Baker, removed a Virginia brigadier from the command of a mixed brigade of North Carolinians and Virginians, named a Maryland officer of the Old Army, George H. Stewart, in his place, and transferred General Iverson from a North Carolina to a Louisiana brigade. When Robert Ransom and Pender had been made major generals, North Carolinians succeeded to their brigades, and when Pettigrew died, Kirkland, of the same state, as already noted, was given his troops. To maintain capable leadership while respecting state pride was an unending problem with Lee. Holding to good men with the same care he exhibited in promoting the capable, Lee dealt considerably with those who were incapacitated or of weak physique. He felt that an invalid corps should be organized such officers, both that they might be employed and also that their absence might not be injurious to their command or prevent the promotion of capable subordinates. The case of General Ewell did not fall precisely in this category, but there was much doubt in Lee's mind whether that stout-hearted soldier could endure the hardships of open campaigning. In January, 1864, when some question was raised as to the physical ability of General Ewell to keep the field, he asked Lee's opinion regarding an application for an easier post. The answer Lee wrote was characteristic, I cannot take upon myself to decide in this matter, he said. You are the proper person, on consultation with your medical advisors. I do not know how much ought to be attributed to long absence from the field, general debility, or the result of your injury, but I was in constant fear during the last campaign that you would sink under your duties or destroy yourself. In either event injury might have resulted. I last spring asked for your appointment provided you were able to take the field. You now know from experience what you have to undergo, and can best judge of your ability to endure it. I fear we cannot anticipate less labor than formerly.
wishing you every happiness and that you may be able to serve the country to the last. Yule decided to stick it out, and Lee did his utmost not to overtax his powers of endurance. In February, 1864, when Lee went to Richmond for consultation with the president, he had to leave General Ewell in command as senior lieutenant general, but he tried to arrange the duty so as to impose the least discomfort on him. At Lee's instance, Major Venable wrote Ewell, he, General Lee, directs me to say that General Chilton will remain here in the office and is instructed to consult with you on all matters of importance connected with the Army. Should it become necessary, General Lee desires you either to move up to Orange Courthouse or to remove the office to your quarters, as you may think best. With the indifferent, Lee tried exhortation or satire, and the inexperienced he ceaselessly sought to train in their duties. When he had to remove an incompetent man, he did so as tactfully and quietly as possible. Not once during the whole war did he initiate court-martial proceedings against an officer, and only in the rarest instances did he call for courts of inquiry. One such case occurred after the New Bern operations of January-February, 1864. On complaint that General Seth M. Barton had failed to do his expected part, Lee forwarded the information to President Davis with the statement that he hoped the explanation of General Barton would be satisfactory. When the reports failed to clear Barton, Lee promptly asked that a court be convened. The troublesome case of Brigadier General William E. Jones illustrated how Lee always endeavored to minimize in the Army of Northern Virginia, by diplomacy and effort, the personal differences that arose almost as frequently as in the Army of Tennessee but created far less scandal. He always saw to it that the Army's soiled linen was washed in camp, not in public. Jones was a professional soldier of undoubted competence and had succeeded Stuart in command of the 1st Virginia Cavalry. Subsequently, he became head of the Laurel Brigade, which contained many of Ashby's famous troopers. He was accounted the best outpost officer in the army, but he had an unfortunate habit of parading his grievances and won the unhappy name of Grumbler Jones. Between him and Stuart, two antagonistic natures, there developed differences that were hopelessly irreconcilable. Jones offered his resignation before the Gettysburg campaign, but Lee withheld it. Subsequently, Stuart brought Jones to a court-martial. Lee sought to transfer him to an infantry brigade to save his services to the army, but when the court-martial findings were confirmed, Lee solved the difficulty and saved Jones's feelings by sending him to southwest Virginia. Colonel Thomas L. Rosser was promoted brigadier general as his successor. Another Jones caused Lee some vexing hours, Major General Samuel Jones, commanding in southwest Virginia. Jones was a high-minded, generous gentleman in every sense, and he had admittedly a difficult line to defend, but he had so little success in dealing with the repeated raids of federal cavalry that the people in that section of Virginia became dissatisfied with him. Lee defended him for many months, but concluded at length that a man who could not make better use of his forces should be transferred somewhere else. When his judgment became fixed, he proceeded directly and without equivocation. Jones was sent to Charleston, S.C., and Major General John C. Breckinridge, former Vice President of the United States, was named in his stead. Before appointing Breckinridge, Davis was urged by some of his friends to name Custis Lee to the place. The President was fully satisfied of Custis's qualifications and offered him the post, but Custis was not anxious to have it, and his father was disinclined to put an inexperienced staff officer in command of so important a district. Lee was proud of the achievements of his sons and nephews, but sedulously avoided anything that smacked of nepotism. He refused to take Robert on his staff, and when he read that several officers of his name and blood were sponsoring a ball at Charlottesville, he wrote, There are too many Lees on the committee. I like all to be present at battles, but can excuse them at balls. Lee's troubles with the Joneses were small compared with those that came to light when the First Corps prepared to rejoin the Army of Northern Virginia in the spring of 1864. Longstreet's high hopes of great achievements in Tennessee had been shattered. Although he retained his full measure of self-assurance in dealing with Lee, he did not distinguish himself after Chickamauga. His disappointment led him to consider retiring, both as commander of the forces in East Tennessee and as head of the First Corps. The War Department had asked Lee if he would consider changing Ewell for Longstreet, but Lee opposed Longstreet's resignation and declined to make an exchange of corps in the belief that both were more effective as they were then organized. 
Having no one to succeed Longstreet who possessed that officer's ability in the field, he was willing to endure his peculiarities for the good of the cause. The contagion of strife in the Army of Tennessee and Longstreet's own bitterness demoralized his command. When he returned to Virginia to await the opening of the spring campaign of 1864, he had three of his generals, McClaws, J. B. Robertson, and E. M. Law, under arrest or under charges. The cases of Robertson and McClaws did not come under Lee's jurisdiction as their alleged offenses occurred in another department. Robertson was suspended for misconduct, according to Longstreet's version, and McClaws, found guilty on one minor charge, was ordered off duty for 60 days, but the findings of the court-martial were disapproved by the president and the officer was restored to field service. He did not return, however, to the Army of Northern Virginia, and when he was subsequently ordered to do so, Lee requested that he be sent elsewhere. That was one of Lee's methods of dealing with men who had failed. So long as they remained with Taylor, he made the best of them. If they were relieved of command for any reason, and better men took their places, he usually saw to it that they were not again given assignments beyond their capacity. As for General Law, the first charges against him were not entertained by President Davis, but when Law appeared again for duty, Longstreet ordered his rearest and made representations of such misbehavior by Law in destroying an official record that General Lee acquiesced in Longstreet's recommendation of a court-martial. Mr. Davis, however, reprimanded Longstreet for ordering the second arrest, whereupon Longstreet became incensed and threatened once more to resign unless the charges against Law were examined. The president did not yield and, so far as the evidence shows, Lee did nothing further. Law served with the army during part of the spring operations of 1864 until he was wounded at Cold Harbor. Subsequently, he was transferred to South Carolina. Longstreet fell into complete disfavor with the administration as a result of these affairs and received one of the sharpest censures delivered during the war for making some inquiry as to why General Charles Field had been promoted. He was told that his remarks were highly insubordinate and that his inquiry was a direct reflection upon the executive. That was the end of Longstreet's brief role as a confidential advisor of the Secretary of War, except in one instance. Along with these troublesome questions of promotion and discipline, Lee had to discharge during the winter of 1863-1864 for the continuous duty of soothing the sensibilities of officers whose minds the weariness of war was disturbing. Nor did this task end with the inactive season. Rather did it increase as the twilight of the Confederacy approached. Even at headquarters he had to mollify some aggrieved officers. Lee never had an adequate personal staff. As an engineer he had not been accustomed to having many assistants, and as the responsible head of an army of declining strength he was unwilling to set a bad example by taking a large number of officers from the combat units. Chilton, Long, Venable, Marshall, and Taylor, five clerks, an indefatigable quartermaster in the person of Major Harmon, Bernard Lynch, the mess steward, and Perry, who had remained as Lee's body servant for a short time after he was emancipated after the Custis will, these were his whole personal entourage from highest to humblest. After Long was promoted Chief of Artillery of the Second Corps, Lee did not fill his place. His personal staff work fell on four men, and an undue part of it on Major Taylor, the great ambition of whose life was to satisfy the general. There were moments of unhappiness in the dealings of the older men with the rapid, efficient young assistant adjutant general, but Lee would usually relieve these by a kindly inquiry or by a friendly chat in a headquarters tent. The tycoon, as his staff officers sometimes irreverently styled Lee, generally used only Major Marshall and Major Venable in the field except during action, and then he pressed into service all of his aides and the officers of the general staff attached to his headquarters. Major Taylor was left in charge of the paperwork, though whenever opportunity offered, he continued to indulge himself in daring feats on the field of battle. Colonel Chilton remained titular chief of staff, but either because he was not suited for the post, or else, because Lee was his own principal staff officer, Chilton gradually turned over the duties of that office to Taylor and acted as inspector general. The arrangement was not wholly satisfactory and least of all to Chilton, who was thoroughly devoted to the Southern cause. In March, 1864, following some failure on the part of the Senate to commission him at an acceptable date as Brigadier General, he asked to be relieved that he might accept appointment with the Adjutant General.
When Chilton decided to leave, Lee wrote him a friendly, tactful letter, regretting his departure and praising his service, but saying frankly that he believed he would be of more general service with General Cooper than with him. I shall always feel great interest in your welfare and success, he wrote, and trust that in your future sphere of action, your zeal, energy, and intelligence will be as conspicuous as in your former. Lee occasionally used other staff officers for short periods of emergency, but he chose no successor to Chilton and during the winter of 18631864 merely divided the ever-increasing duties among the three who were constantly with him. He was exacting of his staff officers and in the feeling that they must join with him in subordinating self to duty, he gave them few furloughs and no promotion that was not awarded by act of Congress. They had the greatest respect for him, but did not share the general awe of the army for his presence. They knew that he was a hard taskmaster and that his temper was strong, though usually controlled, and they avoided him when his wrath was aroused or when he was sick and rendered irritable by inability to move about. At such times they dealt with him chiefly through Major Venable, whose age, dignity, and station placed him more nearly on even terms with the general. Except for occasional misunderstandings, Lee's tact and fairness and the loyalty of his aides combined to assure harmony. No general ever had more devoted service than he received from his personal assistants, but surely no officer of like rank ever fought a campaign comparable to that of 1864 with only three men on his staff, and not one of the three a professional soldier. Precise justice, like that of Washington, and consideration for the rights and sensibilities as individuals were Lee's first rules in dealing with his officers. He always gave them the benefit of the doubt. He never praised them except when he was sure they deserved it, but he never rebuked them unless he was certain they merited it. His attitude toward General W. N. Pendleton was typical. The chief of artillery, a minister in private life, had a good sense of organization, was a capable reconnaissance officer, and had a sharp eye for artillery positions, but he was not efficient in combat. His behavior in the affair on the Potomac after the Sharpsburg operations had been much criticized. At least one outspoken artillerist had said that Pendleton was Lee's weakness, like the elephant we have him and we don't know what on earth to do with him. Lee had known Pendleton since their West Point days and had personal attachment for him, coupled with the respect he always had for a clergyman. He cannot have been wholly satisfied with Pendleton, however, because he never gave him real control of the artillery in action and generally left him in charge of the reserve only. During the entire course of the war he never recommended Pendleton for promotion, and when Davis proposed in 1864 to give him a corps in the Army of Tennessee, Lee politely said he could not select him to command a corps in this army. He added, I do not mean to say by that he is not competent, but from what I have seen of him I do not know that he is. In the autumn of 1863, Pendleton forwarded Lee a letter in which he mentioned some question that had been raised as to his handling of the artillery defense of Fredericksburg during the Chancellorsville campaign. Lee evidently had his own doubts on the subject, but he saw no gain from agitating them, and in his answer he did what he could to dismiss the matter. I think, said he, the report of my dissatisfaction at your conduct is given upon small grounds, the statement apparently of your courier, upon whom I turned my back. I must acknowledge I have no recollection of the circumstances or of anything upon which it could have been based. The guns were withdrawn from the heights of Fredericksburg under general instructions given by me. It is difficult now to say, with the afterknowledge of events, whether these instructions could, at the time, have been better executed, or whether if all the guns had remained in position, as you state there was not enough infantry supports, sick, for those retained, more might not have been captured. If that satisfied Pendleton, it did not give the lie to history. Somewhat similar was the case of General Haight. That officer, whom Lee personally esteemed very highly, had been the most unfortunate of Lee's subordinates during the campaigns of 1863. His whole division had been wrongly blamed for the failure on the third day at Gettysburg, to him had fallen the difficult task of covering the rear when the army had recrossed at Falling Waters, and at Bristow Station the two brigades that had been uselessly slaughtered were of his command. At P. Hill very manfully took full blame for Bristow Station and exculpated Haight for Gettysburg and Falling Waters, but there must have been whisperings in the army that Haight was incompetent. When he went to Richmond during the winter, he sought introductions, perhaps with an eye to putting the facts in their true light before the military committees of Congress. Lee gave him a letter to Senator R. M. T. Hunter, in which he reviewed the circumstances leading to Haight's promotion and said, at Gettysburg, 
General Haight was wounded in the battle of the first day when he steadily drove the enemy before him. He was unable to take further part in the battles around Gettysburg but resumed command of his division on the march from Pennsylvania. At Bristow his division was again engaged and according to the report of G.N.L. Hill, who was present, performed its duty. I have given you a part of G.N.L. Haight's military history and refer you to the official reports of the battle's name to show you that he is worthy of your attention. That was all, just, friendly, and precise, even to saying that, according to the report of G.N.L. Hill, Haight had not been to blame at Bristow. Not having been present himself, Lee would not vouch for more. During the winter of 18631864, General Early served for a time in the Shenandoah Valley. He was well disciplined and devoted, but a better strategist than a tactician. At Malvern Hill, he had lost himself in the woods, and at Bristow Station, he had floundered about. Few, however, were more censorious or more outspoken in criticism of other officers. While directing the operations of General Imboden in the valley, he so often disparaged that officer that Imboden, in desperation, appealed for a court of inquiry. Early endorsed the application with the statement that Imboden's command was poor in discipline and that he would not like to have to rely on it in an emergency. The papers in due course reached General Lee. He had already heard Early's complaints of Imboden and was inclined to believe them well-founded, but he did not think any good could result from airing the deficiencies of the troops, so he endorsed the papers simply, General Imboden has been informed by letter today that I do not think a court of inquiry advantageous. Each of the disputants might take that as he pleased, Lee would have none of such a controversy. In his official reports, Lee was equally careful to respect the sensibilities of his subordinates. The preparation of these documents, which was entrusted to Major Marshall, was rarely undertaken until all the subsidiary reports had been received. Marshall had first to reconcile all discrepancies by personal interviews and then he had to complete a rough draft. Lee went over every line of this with a sharp pencil and a sharper eye, eliminating any superfluous word and softening most of the asperities. He weighed every sentence I wrote, Marshall stated, frequently making minute verbal alterations, and questioned me closely as to the evidence on which I based all statements which he did not know to be correct. This method made his reports more nearly accurate than almost any others written on the military operations of the war between the states, but it robbed them of so much of their dramatic interest that Charles Carter Lee, his eldest brother, protested humorously. The government, he said, employed the general to do the fighting but should retain himself to write the reports. We could then combine, he said, and be irresistible. On March 8, 1863, General Lee had sent in the report on the seven days that on Fredericksburg was signed April 10, 1863, that covering 2nd Manassas Board date of June 8, 1863, and that dealing with Sharpsburg was forwarded August 19, 1863. All these he designed to form a continuous narrative. As the report on Gettysburg involved far more questions of personal inefficiency than any of the others, he took infinite pains to make it historically valid without reflecting needlessly on anyone. He struck out, as already noted, Marshall's caustic references to Stuart's responsibility for the confusion after the army entered Pennsylvania, he made no criticism of Ewell or of Longstreet, and when he completed the paper, January 20, 1864, there was not a phrase in it to arouse jealousies or to injure the morale of the army. His rule in preparing his reports was to state facts without personal censure, and sometimes, as in the report on Chancellorsville, it was only when he omitted praise that criticism could be implied. As he was in these reports, so he was in his dealings with all his officers, and not in serious matters only. He took every opportunity of showing them small acts of kindness. Especially if an officer was visited in camp by his wife, Lee saw to it that they had evidence of his goodwill. When the campaign was about to open in 1864, he issued the usual order of women to the rear, but as the enemy showed no signs of moving, the wives of some of the officers lingered unduly. One day, when Lee went aboard a train at Orange Courthouse, he found Captain A. R. H. Ranson with Mrs. Ranson. He stopped and said, Captain Ranson, I wish you to introduce me to Mrs. Ranson. The young woman arose instantly and began, Oh, General Lee, I disregarded your order. It was my doing, not my husband's, and I beg of you to forgive both of us. Pray do not disturb yourself, Lee said. My order was not intended for you at all.
It was intended only for your husband. I intend to get a good deal of work out of him this summer, and he cannot do his work unless his horses are in condition. Every evening for some weeks, about nightfall, I have observed that he mounted his horse behind his camp and galloped off to Orange Courthouse, three miles away, and every morning he came galloping back about sunrise. Now you know this is not good for the horses. By the time I should need his services, they would be worn out, and I was obliged to put a stop to it. Then he sat down by her and talked so agreeably that he made her forget her concern, but, said Ranson, in recounting the story, there was in General Lee's little joke a reproof and warning to me, and although my wife's fears were relieved, he let me know that he had his eye on me, and that he knew more of my movements than had been supposed. Lee observed, in fact, the conduct of many an officer who did not realize that he was studying him, and in this way he acquired a surprisingly complete knowledge of the capacity of even his colonels. During the mine run operations, when he received a report of a strong demonstration on his right flank, his first question was, who commands the regiment? He knew the answer would tell him what to expect. Finding one day that Colonel Hillary P. Jones had lost his gauntlets, Lee gave him a pair of his own, when he received a proposal to reorganize the Society of the Cincinnati, he opposed it on the ground that it might arouse jealousies, a statement that the officers were not receiving their pay with regularity led him to make prompt representation to the president, there were scores of such incidents. And there were cases, also, where Lee's humor found expression. He was always threatening to marry off his bachelor generals to girls of his acquaintance. The more indifferent the individual to feminine charms, the more insistent Lee was, at least to the young women, that the officer accept the happy bondage of matrimony. General Edward Johnson was, at the time, a serious gallant, but Lee insisted that General Early was a far more acceptable suitor. To his cousin Margaret Stewart he wrote, General Early has just returned from a visit home and is handsomer than ever. He looks high in his new garments, and the black plume in his beaver gives him the air of a gay cavalier, a description that will be illuminated by any picture of early. But when the occasion required, Lee gave remembered counsel or administered unforgettable rebukes. If possible, he was tactful and considerate in this. During the winter a report reached headquarters that the enemy was moving on the extreme right of the Confederate front. Colonel Marshall was at once dispatched to that sector to inform General Ewell and to make proper dispositions. Marshall found that Ewell had already heard the rumor and had discovered it to be without foundation. Naturally, Marshall said nothing about a change in the Confederate front. When he returned and stated the facts, Lee made no protest, but that evening at dinner he called to Marshall from the opposite end of the table. Major Marshall, said he, did you know General Twiggs? Marshall answered that he knew him only by his reputation in the Mexican War. General Twiggs, said Lee, had a way of instilling instruction that was very effective, and no one ever forgot a lesson taught by him. When he went to Mexico, he had a number of young officers connected with his staff who were without experience but very zealous and desirous to do their duty thoroughly. Sometimes they undertook General Twiggs's orders and would fail to do what he told them to do, or would not do it as the general had ordered it to be done. If General Twiggs remarked upon such liberties being taken with his orders, these gentlemen were always ready to show that they were right and that General Twiggs was wrong. The general bore this without complaint or rebuke for some time, but one day a young officer came to report his execution of an order General Twiggs had given him and reported that when he had reached the place where the thing ordered by General Twiggs was to be done, he had found the circumstances so entirely different from what General Twiggs had supposed that he thought that the general would not have given the order had he known the fact and was proceeding to satisfy General Twiggs that what the young officer had done was the best under the circumstances. But General Twiggs interrupted him by saying, Captain, I know that you can prove that you are right, and that my order was wrong, in fact, you gentlemen are always right, but for God's sake do wrong sometimes. Marshall commented, Although General Lee was satisfied with what I had done on this occasion, he wished to impress the lesson of a literal obedience to orders on my mind, and you may be sure that I never forgot it, when it was possible to refer any doubtful matter back to him for further instructions. Lee would restrain the vehemence of his subordinates in the same manner. Out reconnoitering one day with a very partisan officer, Lee was shocked when the man exclaimed that he wished all the enemy were dead. How can you say that, General? Lee exclaimed. Now, I wish that they were all at home attending to their own business and leaving us to do the same.
After Appomattox, he confided to a friend that had never seen a day when he did not pray for the enemy. General Henry A. Hawise was the only man, it would appear, who ever had the temerity to joke with Lee on the subject of his prayers. In 1862, Lee had jestingly informed Wise that he had received a complaint that Wise's troops had been guilty of depredation, but he could hardly credit it because his informant had said that Wise had cursed him. Wise is said to have replied, Well, General Lee, if you will do the praying for the Army of Northern Virginia, I'll be damned if I will not do the swearing. In dealing with laggard officers, and with those who sought to get him to express unfriendly opinions, Lee was usually tactful. Once, later in the war, when an officer's slowness had permitted the Federals to escape, Lee remarked drilly, General, I have sometimes to admonish General Stuart or General Gordon against being too fast. I shall never have occasion to find that fault with you. On another occasion, when an officer tried to make him criticize another general by pointing out his shortcomings, Lee would only say, Well, sir, if that is your opinion of General Blank, I can only say that you differ very widely from the general himself but Lee set limits to his tact. He had a habit, when in camp, of occasionally writing down reflections that somewhat echo Marcus Aurelius, who seems to have been one of Lee's favorite authors. Among these maxims, found in his field valise after his death, was one to this effect, private and public life are subject to the same rules, and truth and manliness are two qualities that will carry you through this world much better than policy, or tact, or expediency, or any other word that was ever devised to conceal a deviation from a straight line. To that rule he held. The same Captain Ranson, whose wife had failed to obey the order to go to the rear, had known General Lee before the war, and was once invited to share with the general the contents of a basket of food that had been sent him. Ranson was late in arriving and in answer to a message that Lee was waiting for him, hurriedly put in an appearance. Captain Ranson, said Lee gravely, do you think it right to keep us all waiting in this way? Ranson tried to apologize and, later in the evening when a bottle of Madeira was passed around, made some feeble joke about the incongruity of drinking such wine from tin cups. His table companions received his jest in cold silence, but Lee remarked that the wine had come from an old lady, a friend of his in Petersburg, and that he was afraid she would not relish the joke. Ranson subsided. I felt, he confessed later, as if I would be glad if the earth would open and swallow me up. Lee was particularly sensitive to greediness, and in dealing with it he was not diplomatic. Once, when a corps commander and one of his aides dined with the commander, Lee had on the table a dish of bacon and greens and a solitary slice of beef that someone had sent him. The lieutenant general, when asked what he would have, asked for the vegetables, but when Lee put the same question to the aide, he said he would have some beef. Lee gave him the slice. A little later, Lee chanced to have dinner with the same lieutenant general, who had provided a roast of beef. When his host inquired what he cared to eat, Lee turned smilingly to the same greedy aide, I will thank you for a piece of that beef, if Captain S. does not want all of it. A more vigorous forthrightness is reported to have been displayed after the army had moved to the Richmond line, during the summer of 1864, when Lee happened to meet near the front an officer who was always careful to keep to the rear. Good morning, General, Lee is alleged to have said, with undisguised sarcasm, are you not afraid to trust yourself so far from the city and to come where all this firing and danger is? Oh, General, said the officer, I am somewhere upon the lines every day. Indeed, said Lee, I am very glad to learn it, sir. Good morning, General, and he is said to have turned away with something closely akin to scorn. Once again, during the Spotsylvania campaign, a general of infantry hotly berated the cavalry for permitting Sheridan to break through and destroy a food depot. And they have captured my cow, he complained, and I have no milk for my coffee. If I were in command of this army, I would notify General Grant that, inasmuch as he had sent his cavalry to the rear and destroyed our rations, I should not give his prisoners whom we hold a morsel of food, and if he wanted to save them from starvation, he would have to send rations here to them. Lee passed at that moment. The officer repeated what he had said. Turning impatiently to him, but making no pause as he walked, Lee broke forth, The prisoners that we have here, General, are my prisoners, they are not General Grant's prisoners, and as long as I have any rations at all I shall divide them with my prisoners. Except in the case of Longstreet, Lee was usually less disposed to employ his tact in dealing with professional soldiers than with civilians who had taken up arms.
He had always been frank with Jackson and he was occasionally plain-spoken with Stuart. Among Stuart's scouts was a daring young man, Channing Smith, a kinsman of Governor William Smith of Virginia, successor to Governor Letcher. The chief of the Cavalry Corps carried on a correspondence with Governor Smith and sent him, on occasion, reports in which he recounted with praise the exploits of Channing Smith and some of his other scouts. Governor Smith thoughtlessly let parts of these letters be printed. When they came under Lee's eye, he pointed to this paragraph in an early dispatch to Stewart, from some letters of yours to Governor Smith published in the papers, I consider the lives of Stringfellow, Channing Smith and others greatly jeopardized. They will be watched for, and if caught, hardly dealt by. You had better recall them and replace them by others. I do not consider that I can make my official letters to the department public without the authority and permission of the Secretary of War, or furnish copies to others. The rebuke was as positive as it was delicate. The self-mastery and the unfailing consideration displayed toward the fiery men about General Lee had its effect upon others. As his officers found him quick to reward merit and slow to blame, always just and always generous, ready to instruct the inexperienced and to trust the capable, there developed among them a respect for his character as great as their admiration for his military skill. Slowly he came in their minds not only to represent their cause, but to incarnate it and to idealize it. Proud as was the name of the Army of Northern Virginia, they almost ceased to say that they belonged to that host and spoke of themselves as serving in Lee's army. And by that more personal name, with all the tribute to Lee that it implied, they usually styled the army in familiar conversation till it had become only the glamorous memory of their waning years. Chapter 14 Can the Army Be Saved for New Battles? That the Army of Northern Virginia did not decline in morale during the winter of 1863-1864 was due, first of all, to its previous record of victories. Soldiers who had triumphed at Second Manassas, at Fredericksburg, and at Chancellorsville refused to regard Gettysburg, Bristow Station, and Rappahannock Bridge as anything more than a succession of unhappy accidents. Having beaten the enemy often, the men would not believe the Federals had so improved in generalship or in fighting prowess that they could defeat them except when circumstances, the elements, or the superiority of position gave the Army of the Potomac an unassailable advantage. The adaptability of the individual contributed, in the second place, to the Army's morale during the same shivering months. The majority of Lee's soldiers were country boys, many of them only one or two generations from the frontier and nearly all of them accustomed to a primitive life in which every man had to shift for himself. The regiments from the rural districts had shown their resourcefulness early in the war. Those from the cities had quickly reverted to species and by the third winter of the war were equally adept in the art of making themselves comfortable wherever they were thrown. The men's ingenuity increased in proportion to their hardships. Still a third factor was the invincible good cheer of the troops. This probably had its origin in the isolated lives they had led prior to the war. Once the embarrassment of new association had worn off, contact with men from other states was stimulating. Only the most incurable pessimist failed to contribute his part to the merriment of camp, much after the manner of boys who were showing off. The sternest experience was softened by their jokes, as in the case of the hot and hungry infantrymen who came upon a group of commissary officers seated under a clump of trees and enjoying an ample dinner. The soldier, a North Carolinian, walked up to the fence that surrounded the grove, put his head through the palings, gazed longingly, and then remarked with fine satire, I say, misters, did any of you ever hearn tell of the Battle of Chancellorsville? Of similar spirit was the sick, straggling Georgia private who was plodding through the woods one day in the fall of 1863 when he was overtaken by a North Carolina bandsman with a great bass drum. The soldiers had made life so miserable for the musicians that this sensitive votary of the muse had left the road and was making his way quietly forward among the trees to escape the jibes at his music and his valor. He stalked past the Georgian without a word, only to be halted by a plaintive voice, Mr. Oh, Mr. Sympathetically, the drummer turned. What can I do for you? he inquired. In the same voice, the soldier asked, Won't you be so kind as to pick a tune on that AR thing? An army that ate the meat of mirth could keep its morale even on the rancid bacon and cornbread that often formed its only ration. Religion was another factor in sustaining the spirit of the soldiers through the long, blusterous months on the Rapidan. The revivals begun the previous year were still sweeping through the camps. 
Nearly every brigade built itself a log chapel, into which, night after night, the men crowded to hear fervent preachers tell of an everlasting life that robbed the many of its terror. That winter 15,000 men were converted, and many of them were fired with a faith that defied the battle. Lee himself was a force no less potent in preserving the morale of the army. His methods were as simple as they were effective. They reflected his own character and his interest in the welfare of the men entrusted to him, and in no sense did they bespeak any ordered, calculating analysis of what would or would not inspire soldiers. He rode frequently among the camps, alone or attended by only one or two staff officers. Sometimes the men would cheer him, more often they received him with a silence that was almost reverent. Yet they never hesitated to bring him their complaints, in the knowledge that he would always receive them as friends in a common cause. During the Gettysburg campaign, as Lee stood by a road along which a column of half-exhausted men were marching under a singeing sun, a stout private broke ranks and approached him. Some of the staff turned the man back, but Lee told them to let him come to him. What is it you want? he said kindly. The soldier, who was perspiring in streams, answered quickly, Please, General, I don't want much, but it's powerful wet marching this weather. I can't see for the water in my eyes. I came aside to this old hill to get a rag or something to wipe the sweat out of my eyes. Lee immediately took out his handkerchief and handed it to him. Will this do? he inquired. Yes, my lordy, that indeed, the man exclaimed. Well, then, Lee answer encouragingly, take it with you, and back quick to ranks, no straggling this march, you know, my man. General Sorrel, who witnessed this typical incident, said in comment on it, Lee's talk and manner with the soldier were inimitable in their encouraging kindness. John H. Worsham recalled that after the campaign of 1864 opened, Lee chanced again to be by the roadside, mounted on Traveller, while some of his veterans were on the march. As our column approached him, he wrote, an old private stepped out of ranks and advanced to General Lee. They shook hands like acquaintances and entered into a lively conversation. As I moved on, I looked back, and the old man had his gun in one hand and the other hand on Traveller's neck, still talking. Lee was as simple with the farmers of the countryside as he was with his soldiers. On one of the advances of the army, a farmer rode up to a bivouac where Lee was sitting and addressed him as Colonel, not guessing his identity. Lee put him at his ease and chatted with him for some time. At length, the planter told the Colonel that he had come to the army in the hope of seeing General Lee and wondered if it was possible for him to do so. I am General Lee, his host replied, and I am most happy to have met you. While he was on the Rappahannock, a soldier called at Lee's tent with his wife. Lee invited the couple in and soon learned all about them by friendly questions. She was from Abbeville District, S.C., he enthusiastically wrote Mrs. Lee that night. Said she had not seen her husband for more than two years, and, as he had written to her for clothes, she herself thought she would bring them on. It was the first time she had traveled by railroad, but she got along very well by herself. She brought an entire suit of her own manufacture for her husband. She spun the yarn and made the clothes herself. She clad her three children in the same way and had on a beautiful pair of gloves she had made for herself. Her children she had left with her sister. She was very pleasing in her address and modest in her manner and was clad in a nice, new alpaca. I am certain she could not have made that. She, in fact, was an admirable woman said she was willing to give up everything she had in the world to attain our independence, and the only complaint she made of the conduct of our enemies was their arming our servants against us. Her greatest difficulty was to procure shoes. She made them for herself and children of cloth with leather soles. She sat with me about ten minutes and took her leave, another mark of sense, and made no request for herself or husband. With the courtesy he showed this woman, he welcomed all visitors, humble in station or exalted in rank. Only those who came to appeal from the verdict of courts-martial and those who importuned him for promotion found access to him difficult. If an officer wrote him in protest at the elevation of someone else, or in complaint of his failure to receive recognition, Lee would turn the paper over to one of his staff with the request, sewage him, Colonel, sewage him. If he could avoid it without discourtesy, he would not grant an interview to such an officer.
Once, after a man with a grievance had insisted on seeing him, Lee came out of his quarters with flushed face and exclaimed to Colonel Venable, Why did you permit that man to come to my tent and make me show my temper? Lee's respect for the individuality of his men extended to their wants and their duties. He was quick to defend them against discrimination and against imposition. The settlers who set themselves up at Orange Courthouse during the winter were, in the main, a grasping lot, and they became so exorbitant in their charges that the men rose against them and plundered their wares. In plaintive indignation the settlers hurried to General Lee to ask protection for the future. He heard their protests with his wanted patience and ended by putting this question to them, you think that the boys treated you badly? The settlers were of one mind, outrageously, General, they insisted, outrageously. Lee looked at them, had you not, then, better set up shop somewhere else? They did. On the other hand, he investigated every disgrievance, and when a prisoner complained to him that the soldiers had abused and taunted him, Lee was instant in his reproof. The spiritual needs of his men he supplied, also, as best he could. Some of his generals, less religious in nature than he, fell into the habit of making Sunday a time for reviews and festivities. Two of the chaplains came to Lee and tactfully asked that military duties on the Sabbath day be reduced to the necessary minimum. Lee made no promises but let the conversation drift to the progress of the revivals. One of the clergymen noted that as they told of what was happening, we saw his eye brighten and his whole countenance glow with pleasure. When the ministers rose to leave, the spokesman stated, I think it right that I should say to you, General, that the chaplains of this army have a deep interest in your welfare and that some of the most fervent prayers we offer are in your behalf. Lee flushed, and tears came into his eyes. He choked for a moment and then, with the directness that would have been Kant in a soul less simple than his, he replied, Please thank them for that, sir. I warmly appreciate it. And I can only say that I am nothing but a poor sinner, trusting in Christ alone for salvation, and need all the prayers they can offer for me. The next day he issued a general order for the better observance of the Sabbath. He went regularly to church, and not infrequently, when his duties did not press too heavily, he attended the chaplain's meetings. His regard for his men was, of course, known to them, and when coupled with their respect for him as a soldier, it produced in them something akin to the idolatry of youth for greatness. After one of his battles, Lee met a soldier who was coming from the front with a shattered right arm. I grieve for you, my poor fellow, Lee said, can I do anything for you? The soldier answered, yes, sir, you can shake hands with me, general, if you will consent to take my left hand. Lee grasped his powder-stained hand warmly, with an admiration he made no effort to conceal. Late in the winter a scout arrived at headquarters with newspapers and reports of a heavy eastward movement of troop trains along the Baltimore and Ohio. The scout, who was only a boy in years, had ridden one horse to death in order to reach Lee speedily and was close to collapse. Lee listened to him and left for a moment to issue an order. When he returned, he found that the boy had toppled over from his camp stool and had fallen half on the general's cot, in the deep sleep of exhaustion. Lee covered him, walked out of the tent, tied the flap and left him alone until his cramped position caused him to awaken, two hours later. Then the general supplied him with food and saw to it that he received proper care. Incidents of this sort became known to the army and explain why it was that in March, 1864, when he was in Richmond, the men who were waiting at the transportation office heard of his presence in the city and with many a God bless him, inquired where they could see him. But perhaps the best tribute to him was paid one night when some of the infantry were discussing the origin of species, which had then been published less than four years. Darwinism had its warm advocates, but one soldier refused to accept the arguments. Well, boys, he said, the rest of U.S. may have developed from monkeys, but I tell you none less than God could have made such a man as Moss Robert. The material wants of the men who gave him this measure of admiration could not be supplied that winter. Some of the worst wear and tear in clothing and footgear had been offset by September, 1863, but as the fall advanced and the weather grew worse, the depletion of Confederate credits abroad and the capture of several ships loaded with quartermaster stores resulted in such a shortage that shoes were worn out faster than they could be replaced. There were thousands of barefooted men in the army before the end of October.
After a period of extremely cold weather in January, only 50 men in one regiment were decently shod, and a brigade sent out on picket duty had to leave behind its several hundred men who could not march because of the condition of their shoes. Lee sought to save every hide he could, and to remedy the shortage he undertook to have shoes made in the army, but with indifferent success. He kept the women of his family and all their acquaintances busy knitting warm socks, especially for the men whose homes were within the enemy's lines. It was characteristic of Lee, however, to withhold his requisitions during a part of the winter, in order that Longstreet's troops in the mountains might get shoes. As for blankets, they were to be had only by importation, as the South produced none. Worse even than the shortage of shoes and blankets was the lack of food for the men. As early as June, 1863, Commissary General Northrop had served warning that the meat supply in the South would not last until the new bacon came in. In July he had notified Lee that he would be compelled to recommend a reduction in the ration, and in his annual report for 1863 he stated that there would not be enough meat in the country during the next 12 months for the people and the army. As the civilians would insist on having meat, he added bitterly that the troops must bear the brunt of hunger as well as of arms. By December, 1863, the government had only 25 days' supply of beef and bacon east of the Mississippi and had no reserve whatsoever in Virginia. In January the shortage of cereals was almost as acute. Davis contrived to get 90,000 pounds of meat when it seemed that the army must go without fats, but the daily ration had to be cut to four ounces of bacon or salt pork, with only one pint of cornmeal per man. For two days during the winter the men went without any food. One hungry soldier anonymously sent Lee his meat ration, carefully placed between two chips, and wrote sadly that though he had been born a gentleman, hunger had forced him to steal. Another man in the ranks wrote Lee asking if he knew of the want to which the army had been reduced. He added that if the general was aware of conditions, the men would realize there was reason for the shortage. Lee did not answer directly, but the next day he issued an order explaining the situation and exhorting the troops to endure as their forefathers had in the revolution. The soldiers responded to his appeal loyally and complained little, but as they surveyed their scant allowance of unbolted meal, they started a grim joke which lingered in the army until Appomattox that the opposing forces were the fed and the corn fed. There were weeks, of course, during which the rations of some of the units were ample, but the periods of want were so frequent and so prolonged that Lee had to inform the administration in the most somber terms that ruin was threatened if the army was not rationed. On January 22, 1864, he wrote the Secretary of War, unless there is a change, I fear the army cannot be kept effective, and probably cannot be kept together. As late as April 12, when the opening of the campaign waited only on the final preparations of the enemy across the Rapidan, Lee told the president, I cannot see how we can operate with our present supplies. The reasons for this struggle with starvation were numerous. The southern states prior to 1861 had been heavy importers of pork. After the commencement of the dark conflict, the government was slow to contract for adequate supplies of meat from abroad. The management of the commissary had been negligent and inefficient. The railroads were inadequate to the demands made on their worn equipment and track serious as were these conditions, it was not Lee's nature to content himself with explaining to the administration their inevitable consequences. Through the whole of the winter, he strove himself to correct these conditions. The subsistence of the troops became his first and greatest concern. What could he do to get food for the men? First of all, as he saw it, the improvement of the railroads and the better use of their rolling stock were essential. At the beginning of the war, the railways had thought they would inevitably be ruined and they had encouraged their operatives to enlist in order to save expenses. Many of them had neglected maintenance and none of them had been able to replace worn-out equipment. Some of the more progressive lines had purchased a few necessities in Europe and had brought them in through the blockade, but they had received scanty encouragement from the government, which, however, had refused to take over the operation of the railways. As a result of all this, the lines deteriorated during the winter of 1863-1864, while the demands on them increased steadily, chiefly because the exhaustion of grain in Virginia and North Carolina necessitated the hauling of corn from Georgia to feed the men and horses of Lee's army. By the end of 1863, the Virginia Central Railroad, which was Lee's supply line from Richmond, was so close to a breakdown that when it handled troops it could not deliver provisions or forage.
In January, 1864, when Lee moved Hoke's brigade to North Carolina for the New Bern expedition, he had to dispatch the regiments on separate days in the freight cars that had delivered supplies. In February, Lee was forced to march Battle's brigade to the Richmond, Fredericksburg and Potomac Railroad and transport the men thence to Hanover Junction because the Virginia Central was unable to move them. By March, the Virginia Central had but eight locomotives in working order. The next month, Longstreet's corps could only be brought back from Bristol at the rate of 1,500 a day. Tracks were as bad as the equipment, for no new rails were being rolled in the Confederacy. To complete the railroad from Greensboro, N.C., to Danville, Virginia, so that Lee might not be cut off from the south in case the Petersburg and Weldon Railroad was broken by the enemy, the Confederacy actually had to take up the rails on the York River Railroad and on six miles of the Charlottesville and Statesville Railroad and replace them on the new line. Lee had long foreseen the danger of the collapse of the railways. One of his first orders after assuming command in March, 1862, had been designed to straighten out a railroad tangle, and now, with the crisis at hand, he conserved his rail transportation with the utmost care. He had previously urged the officials of the Virginia Central Railroad to improve their line, and he made it mandatory that all cars be unloaded and returned promptly. On occasion, he did not hesitate to employ the troops around Richmond in repair work on the railroads. He agreed, if necessary, to release car builders from the ranks, though he believed ship carpenters could be utilized for this purpose. Likewise, he joined most earnestly with Northrop in urging that passenger trains be withdrawn from service in order that the lines should be used only for moving troops and supplies, and he went even further in advocating the evacuation of non-combatants and prisoners from Richmond where they had to be fed, in part, with transported supplies. In the same spirit, Lee endeavored to prevent the wastage of provisions en route to the army. Thanks to this cooperation, the energetic administration of a new quartermaster general, A. R. Lawton, a former brigadier in the Army of Northern Virginia, kept the wheels turning and prevented the collapse that would otherwise have occurred. In March, 1864, Lawton was able to report that the creaking lines were hauling more than at almost any other period of the war, though it was admittedly a forced march. Knowing that the railroads, under the best possible management, could not be relied upon to bring a sufficiency of supplies to the army, Lee's second method of providing food for his men was through raids into western and southwestern Virginia. Many hogs and cattle were procured in this way. At one time, raids became so necessary that Lee was prepared to undertake them in almost any quarter where supplies were to be had in a quantity to justify them. Besides these measures, Lee advocated and prevailed upon the War Department to approve a system of trading with the enemy, he sent off most of the cavalry into country where it could subsist itself, he protested against the practice whereby officers were allowed to purchase food at the various army posts for their families, he issued strict orders to protect cultivated enclosures, he granted furloughs at the rate of 16 for each 100 men, in order that they might not have to be fed at the front, but he was restrained in doing this by the knowledge that if too many furloughs were issued, the railroad trains would be overcrowded. At his own headquarters, he set an example of the utmost frugality. All luxuries that were sent by admirers he dispatched forthwith to the hospitals, and as protests were made against this, he replied simply, I am content to share the rations of my men. When a plain meal was finished he would sometimes say to Major Taylor, well, we are just as well off as if we had feasted on the best in the land, our hunger is appeased, and I am satisfied. A simple vegetable dinner drew forth his warmest praise when he was visiting, and his own midday fare was usually cabbage boiled in salt water. Once when he had guests, he ordered middling bacon with the cabbage, but when the diners sat down, the meat was so scant that all of them politely declined it. The next day, recalling that meat had not been eaten, he bade his steward bring it, only to be met with the confession that there had been no bacon at headquarters and that what he had seen the previous day had been borrowed and had been duly returned to its owner, untouched. On the rare occasions when food was abundant and Lee's table was graced with a piece of beef or with a joint of mutton, which was one of his favorite dishes, he would always remark, if urged to have a second helping, I would really enjoy another piece, but I have had my allowance. All that could be devised to relieve the scarcity of food, Lee undertook diligently, except one thing, he would not resort to indiscriminate impressment of the little that the people in the war zone had for their own subsistence, and in refusing to do this, he had a long, pointed correspondence with the commissary general. The shortage that Lee sought to ease by these measures extended equally to the feed for the horses.
At the end of August, 1863, promises had been made that the army would be supplied with 3,000 bushels of corn a day, but before the middle of November, the amount had fallen off so heavily that Lee feared unless more was forthcoming many animals would be lost during the winter. Ere long the daily supply declined to 1,000 bushels a day, and the hay and fodder were relatively even less. Instead of 10 pounds of corn and 10 of long forage per diem, the horses often got only 5 pounds of corn and nothing besides. Sometimes only a little hay or unthreshed wheat or dry straw was available. The horses would eat the bark off trees, would gnaw through the trunks of the smaller forest growth and would devour empty bags, scraps of papers and all the small debris of camp. Lee's love of animals and his dependence on his transport for the execution of his plans alike prompted him to take such drastic relief measures as were in his power. All the forage in a large area was reserved for the army, boards of officers were sent out in search of communities where the mounts could be kept alive, most of the artillery was retired to the line of the Virginia Central Railroad, the cavalry were scattered for miles beyond either flank, detached cavalry forces were moved to more distant points in order that they might not consume forage within hauling distance of the army. The farmers, by Lee's orders, were not allowed to retain more than six months' supply of corn for their animals. Once, when he saw that the saddles of a cavalry command had slipped after the animals had climbed a long hill, he personally had them readjusted and, at the end of the march, sent for the officers and gave them a practical lecture on the care of the horses' backs. There was no misreading the ominous meaning of the slow starvation of the horses. All the apprehension that Lee had felt the previous winter over the prospective exhaustion of the horse supply was now sharpened, because it was conceded that if the horses died they could not be replaced. As early as July, 1863, the Quartermaster General had advised that 8,000 to 10,000 animals were absolutely necessary to replace those killed or worn out, but they could not be found east of the Mississippi. General Pendleton fostered a system of infirmaries and saved many horses that would otherwise have died. The loss through hunger and disease was heavy, nonetheless. Butler's brigade, which had received 2,000 horses in a year, could not mount 500 men in February, yet could not be spared from the front to recruit either men or animals. Longstreet had been unable to take all his batteries with him to Georgia for lack of horses to pull the guns, and when the spring approached, General Bragg had to recommend that Lee's artillery be reduced for the same reason. I have never found it too large in battle, Lee replied, though he expressed his willingness to weaken that arm if it should develop that the horses could not be provided. Half of the animals in Stewart's horse artillery were reported to have died during the winter, and a reduction in the number of his batteries seemed inevitable. Five days before the opening of Grant's offensive, May 4, 1864, Lee reported that he was unable to get the troops together for one of forage. To the burden of maintaining the army's morale and of finding food for its personnel and horses was added, all winter long, the labor of recruiting the ranks for the coming campaign. Lee accepted as final the statement of President Davis after Gettysburg that he saw no means of raising the army to the strength it had possessed before that battle. The general saw his forces reduced by the departure of Longstreet's corps, then raised to around 48,000 men during the months from October through December by the return of the wounded, and then diminished again by furloughs and detachments to around 35,000 at the middle of February. When conditions were at the worst, the absentees from the Second Corps alone numbered 11,610, including prisoners of war. Lee's chief hope of building up his army to effective fighting strength lay, of course, in procuring the return of the detached units, but he deferred any attempt to this end until March, because of the shortage of supplies. His next hope was in a sterner policy of conscription that would bring into the ranks those who were still evading military duty. The Second Conscription Act, which had been approved by the President September 27, 1862, just after the Maryland expedition, had raised the age limit of compulsory military service from 35 to 45 years, but this law had been much weakened by exemptions subsequently voted, and its enforcement had led to a dual system under which General Gideon Pillow had undertaken what might be termed enforced volunteering for Bragg's army at the same time that the regular conscription. Officers were scouring the land. By the winter of 1863-1864, it was manifest that a more drastic statute and more vigorous enforcement were necessary. Lee threw all his influence on the side of universal compulsory service. 
the law, he wrote the president, should not open to the charge of partiality, and I do not know how this can be accomplished, without embracing the whole population capable of bearing arms, with the most limited exemptions, avoiding anything that would look like a distinction of classes. The exemptions of persons of particular and necessary avocations had better be made as far as possible by authority of the department rather than by special enactment. He was equally insistent that the law and the practice should be changed to make it impossible for a man subject to conscription to join some easy command and then to claim, tacitly at least, that he could not be sent to the armies that were seeing hard service. Instances of this sort had occurred when some of General Samuel Jones's troops had been dispatched to Lee after the Gettysburg Campaign. Desertions among these men had been heavy because they had regarded their call to the front as a breach of implied contract. The same reasoning by soldiers in the ranks had weakened Imboden's command. In South Carolina, it was notorious that very large cavalry regiments had been recruited with privates of this mind, while the volunteer regiments from that state had been depleted by gallant fighting to mere cadres. These conditions were corrected to some extent by the Third Conscription Act, approved on February 17, 1864, which lowered the age limit to 17 and raised it to 50 years, with the proviso that the oldest and youngest recruits should be organized for state defense. Much stronger regulations concerning exemptions and disability were put into effect the next month. Substitution was barred by another statute, and those who had hired substitutes were made liable to conscription. There was hope that these measures would bring substantial reinforcements to the army, as it was estimated that 126,000 white men between 18 and 55 years were still available in the South. Having done his utmost through official channels to have the law made more effective, Lee had to rely, for the rest, on careful administration of the army to increase its combatant strength. His steps to this end, falling into two general categories, showed much resourcefulness and exhibited the inflexible resolution he had displayed in so many other matters to spare no effort to win Southern independence. His first measures, which took a wide diversity of form, were designed to prevent the wastage of troops he had. He exercised great vigilance in declining to issue furloughs, except in accordance with the general policy he had laid down to send numbers of his men home in order to relieve the pressure on the commissary. Furloughs were refused to members of the Georgia legislature, who were commissioned officers in the army. When war-worn Florida, Alabama and Texas troops sought permission to visit their native states and to recruit, he declined unequivocally unless acceptable units, with the same number of men, were sent him in advance. He refused extensions of leave in individual cases, even at the instance of such persuasive young friends as the brilliant Miss Bell Stewart of Brook Hill. The policy of keeping down wastage from the ranks Lee applied, in the same way, to all details for detached duty, especially to those that placed soldiers near their homes, where they would be disposed to employ kinsmen as assistants. He declined to detail men because their families had need of them, or because there were many brothers of the same family in the army. It is impossible, he said, to equalize the burdens of this war, some must suffer more than others. He stopped promotion to the rank of junior second lieutenant soon after the Gettysburg campaign. During the winter, he sent examining boards of surgeons to the hospitals to bring back malingerers and able-bodied men acting as stewards. He prevailed upon Congress to prohibit the formation of new companies of partisan rangers because these were being recruited secretly from the infantry. When the law became operative, he was disposed to accept only Mosby's command from its provisions. Similarly, he protested against a proposal to organize a company of horse artillery from within the enemy's lines for use in southwest Virginia on the ground that this would simply mean taking men from existing commands. As a deterrent to men who sought easy posts, as well as to those who lost hope and courage, he had to maintain a stern policy toward deserters. Wherever possible he saved them from the death penalty, but he refused to deal with any of them until they had returned to the army. Occasionally, he sent out parties to recover deserters. Direct recruitment and re-enlistment were Lee's second method of internal administration for the maintenance of his armed strength. Taking care not to interfere with the regular work of conscription, he offered a 30-day furlough to every private soldier who procured an able-bodied recruit, as great a stimulus as could have been applied. Every voluntary re-enlistment for the war by commands whose time had expired under the law, he commended in general orders.
General Hoke and his brigade were retained in North Carolina for a time on recruiting duty. General Imboden was named as chief enrolling officer for a large district under the conscription law. While discharging his other duties, days were spent in efforts to recruit the cavalry, especially the South Carolina regiments. Everywhere that Lee could find a recruit, he sought to bring him into the ranks. Even the guards at Camp Lee in Richmond were called up, and their places were taken by boys and old men. The only exception he made was in the case of the cadets at the Virginia Military Institute. He declined their tender of service with the statement that he wished them to guard the western frontier and would call them if needed, a measure of precaution that ere the campaign was well underway save the day at New Market. Every soldier in the camps and every dweller in the war zone knew how Lee was searching for men. In the coal home, which Lee often visited, the little boy of the household, sitting on his knee, announced that he intended to raise a company. Who? asked Lee. It was a familiar question in his mind, who were to be in the company? I haven't thought of that yet, the lad replied. Will you be one? Yes, said Lee, I'll be glad to. Labor was ceaseless in keeping up the spirit of the men, in finding food for them, in saving the horses from starvation, and in trying to fill the ranks. No campaign wore on Lee with greater severity than did the cruel winter of 18631864. Every resource of mind, all his physical energy, and all the character he had built up through his years of self-control he threw into the struggle to keep his army in condition to fight. Reviewing some of his correspondence, his son wrote, One can see from these letters of my father how deeply he felt for the sufferings of his soldiers and how his plans were hindered by inadequate supplies of food and clothing. I heard him constantly allude to these troubles, indeed, they seemed never absent from his mind. He knew that success depended on calling out the full resources of the country. Determined to do his utmost to that end, he did not permit himself to think what might happen if the country was unwilling to make the necessary sacrifices. That he left to God. Submissive, though determined, he did not quail, even when he read that Lincoln had called for 700,000 new troops in March. 700,000, and the Army of Northern Virginia could not hope to muster 65,000 when Meade crossed the Rapidan. Chapter 15, Preparing for the Campaign of 1864 As the end of the winter of 18631864 approached, Lee began to shape his plan for active operations. He could no longer be guided exclusively by what was desirable in Virginia from the standpoint of strategy. Instead, he had to consider what was practicable with his reduced supplies and weakened transport, and even within these limits he had to adapt his scheme of operations to the increasing threat of a federal invasion of Georgia. Although nothing of military importance, except a raid on Meridian, Mississippi, had occurred since Johnston had taken command of the Army of Tennessee, the outlook was dark. Johnston with a badly equipped army was at Dalton, Georgia, Longstreet was cut off from him and wintering most unhappily in East Tennessee. Opposing these two, the Federals had at hand three strong armies so placed that they could easily be concentrated for an advance into Georgia. How could this dangerous invasion be prevented? No question troubled the administration more, and on none was there a sharper division of opinion. Johnston did not believe he should take the offensive until he was reinforced and supplied with more transportation. Longstreet, after some weeks of virtual despair, concluded that the Confederate armies must advance or be overwhelmed. The administration was for an aggressive policy but was unwilling to strip other parts of the Confederacy of their defenders in order to swell Johnston's ranks. Lee was too busy with the problems of his own army to make a full study of the strategic involvements in Tennessee, and as General Bragg was now chief military adviser to the president, Lee's inclination against volunteering advice to his superiors was stiffened by military etiquette. Moreover, he had heard nothing directly from Johnston and did not know the exact condition of the Army of Tennessee. His chief contact with the situation was through Longstreet, who wrote him often and at length. Longstreet's first proposal was that he be recalled to Lee, that one corps of the army be mounted, and that it be thrown in rear of Meade. Lee pointed out that this was impracticable and urged that Johnston and Longstreet attack the Federals. There followed an exchange of letters in which Longstreet asked for sufficient horses to mount his corps and to operate in Kentucky against the Federals' line of communication. Lee thought that an advance into Kentucky would be desirable, but explained that the horses could not be supplied without rendering immobile the other armies of the Confederacy.
Longstreet then advanced the remarkable proposal that Lee hold Richmond with part of his troops, take the rest to Kentucky, open an offensive there and leave Johnston free to move to Virginia. At this stage of the correspondence, Lee went to Richmond and there learned that the administration favored joint operations by Johnston and Longstreet in Middle Tennessee. Lee had apprehensions whether the country would supply sufficient food and forage for this move, but he commended the plan to the study of Longstreet. A few days later, Longstreet arrived at Lee's headquarters and unfolded still another plan, that Beauregard be sent to join the First Corps and that these forces execute the proposed offensive into Kentucky. This appealed to Lee as more feasible, and inasmuch as President Davis had written to Longstreet inviting suggestions, Lee urged that Longstreet take train to Richmond and present the proposal to the chief executive. Longstreet, however, argued that he was out of favor with the administration and that his authorship would of itself prejudice the government against his project. It would be far better, he said, if Lee put forward the plan. Lee would not, of course, parade another scheme as his own, but he agreed to go to Richmond with Longstreet and to present the question to the president. He made the journey about March 10, and after a quiet Sunday of church attendance and conversation with his family, he called on the president Monday morning, March 14. For this first interview he went alone, probably because he had not procured in advance the president's permission to bring Longstreet with him. There is no record of what happened at this meeting. After dinner, he returned with Longstreet and discussed the situation in the West in much detail but arrived at no conclusion. Longstreet later wrote an account of this council in which he represented General Lee as much disgusted at the insistence of the President and General Bragg on a campaign into Middle Tennessee. Johnston was known to be in opposition, and Bragg himself, after Chickamauga, had pronounced such a movement visionary. It is quite probable that Longstreet's zeal for his own plan led him to exaggerate Lee's disappointment at its rejection, for it is of record that if a way could be found to overcome the shortage of provisions Lee as late as April 2 was in favor of the operation in Middle Tennessee. His inclination throughout was to defer to the judgment of General Johnston who was on the ground and, as Lee said, could better compare the difficulties existing to a forward movement with the disadvantages of remaining quiet. After these conferences, Lee spent a few days in Richmond with his family. He found Mrs. Lee and her daughters diligently knitting socks for the soldiers. Not content with what the household could do, Mrs. Lee enlisted the service of all her regular visitors. Her room, Mrs. Chestnut wrote, was like an industrial school, everybody so busy. The family had more space for these activities because it had moved from 210 East Lee to the mess, a large house, now numbered 707 East Franklin, that had been used previously by Custis and some of his fellow staff officers. Rooney had at last been exchanged and had come home, almost broken-hearted over Charlotte's death, but not embittered by his imprisonment. He was quick to assert that despite the popular hatred of General B. F. Butler he had received the utmost consideration at the hands of that officer. It took no small effort on the part of General Lee to get his son to pull himself together again and to resume his military duties. Custis's state of mind was much the same, anxious for field duty, he still had scruples about undertaking it without experience. He was offered command of the Department of Richmond, long under the direction of Major General Arnold Elsey, but he hesitated to accept it. His father thought he should do so. I appreciate the motives, he said. But until you come in the field, you never will gain experience. Finding Custis unwilling to put aside his compunctions, Lee decided to ask for him as Chief of Engineers of the Army of Northern Virginia, but when he delicately presented two other names besides that of Custis, the Secretary of War passed over Custis and sent him Major General M. L. Smith, a seasoned and very capable officer who was to prove most useful. Custis's own inclination was to come to his father as Chief of Staff, but the General would not approve. This would be very agreeable to me, he said, but more open to all the objections that could be brought against your holding the post of Chief of Engineers. I presume, therefore, it would not be favorably considered. It is a delicate matter to apply for anyone on the staff of another. I am not certain that it is proper to ask for one serving with the President. In addition, it is more important that he should have the aid he desires than I should. While careful about Custis's military correctness, General Lee continued, at the young man's expense, to indulge in his favorite jest of marrying him off. 
in sending a pass about this time to Miss Jenny Washington for herself and her sisters, who had been sojourning at Charlottesville, he assured her, Custis bears up wonderfully under the circumstances. He hopes he has only to wait until six months after the declaration of peace when all public dues are to be paid. Back in the somber camps on the Rapidan, after his stay in Richmond, Lee thought for a few days that the heaviest shock of battle was to come in Tennessee, but by March 28 he concluded that the blow would fall in Virginia. Signs multiplied that the Federals were accumulating a large force in his front, and Longstreet telegraphed from Bristol that the Nine Corps was coming eastward. Lee began to call for his detached units, but was willing to have Longstreet remain in Tennessee if there was a chance of an offensive there. As it became increasingly probable that the Unionists were detaching troops from the Western Army for use in Virginia, Lee reasoned that this might give Johnston a better opportunity for aggressive action, even though Longstreet was recalled to the Army of Northern Virginia. They cannot collect the large force they mention for their operations against Richmond without reducing their other armies, such was his calm statement to the president. The administration took his view of the changed situation and on April 7 ordered Longstreet to return from Bristol, Virginia 10, to Charlottesville to await Lee's orders, though the lack of rail transportation made it uncertain when his movement could begin. Lee's balancing of the ponderables on the military scales was accurate. He could not realize, and few even in Washington could see, that an imponderable was tipping the beam. That imponderable was the influence of President Lincoln. The Richmond government had discounted his every moderate utterance and had capitalized his Emancipation Proclamation in order to stiffen Southern resistance. The Confederate people had mocked him, had despised him, and had hated him. Lee himself, though he had avoided unworthy personal animosities and doubtless had included Mr. Lincoln in his prayers for all his enemies, had made the most of the president's military blunders and fears. References to Lincoln in Lee's correspondence and conversation were rare. He was much more interested in the federal field commanders than in the commander-in-chief. After the late winter of 1863-1864, had Lee known all the facts, he would have given as much care to the study of the mind of the federal president as to the analysis of the strategical methods of his immediate adversaries. For that remarkable man, who had never wavered in his purpose to preserve the Union, had now mustered all his resources of patience and of determination. Those who had sought cunningly to lead him, slowly found that he was leading them. His unconquerable spirit, in some mysterious manner, was being infused into the North as spring approached. By April 3, Lee commenced to bring up the strongest horses, to reduce transportation, and to make preparations for meeting the large army the Federals were mustering. The Northern states were responding wholeheartedly to the calls sent out in March for 700,000 men. Ulysses S. Grant, a soldier equipped with abilities that complemented Lincoln's, had been brought from the West, had been named lieutenant general and had been placed in command of all the Union armies. The prospect stirred Lee. Colonel, he told Taylor, that officer having now been promoted, we have got to whip them, we must whip them, and it has already made me better to think of it. Taylor added, in reporting this conversation to his sweetheart, that Lee had been complaining somewhat and it seemed to do him good to look forward to a test with the present idol of the North. His wish was not immediately gratified, however, for there followed a long rainy spell that transformed the roads into mires. The enemy could not move, of course, until the highways dried, though there was every prospect that as soon as the ground was firm, Grant would cross the river. Meantime, conflicting intelligence reached headquarters as to whether the 11 and 12 Corps were returning to the Army of the Potomac and if so, whether they were moving directly toward the Rapidan or were gathering at Annapolis, Maryland, for some undetermined purpose. Lee studied with the utmost care the reports that came from his spies during this period of waiting, and on April 16 he was satisfied that three attacks were in the making, a main assault across the Rapidan, a diversion in the Valley of Virginia, and an attack on the flank or rear of the Army of Northern Virginia, probably directed against Drury's Bluff on James River, so as to expose the waterline of Richmond. How could this greatest offensive of the war be met? Lee believed that much might still be accomplished by aggressive Confederate action in the West, but from the beginning of the discussion of the next move in Tennessee, he had argued that the alternative to this was an advance in Virginia again need. We are not in a condition, he told the president, and never have been, in my opinion, to invade the enemy's country with a prospect of permanent benefit.
but we can alarm and embarrass him to some extent and thus prevent his undertaking anything of magnitude against us. His judgment now told him that the prudent course was to bring Beauregard's army to defend Richmond and to hasten the movement of Longstreet's corps, which was moving very slowly from Bristol. This done, he desired to move right against the enemy on the Rappahannock, as he phrased it to the president. He went on, should God give us a crowning victory there, all their plans would be dissipated, and their troops now collecting on the waters of the Chesapeake would be recalled to the defense of Washington. Regretfully, he had to add, but to make this move I must have provisions and forage. I am not yet able to call to me the cavalry or artillery. If I am obliged to retire from this line, either by a flank movement of the enemy or the want of supplies, great injury will befall us. I have ventured to throw out these suggestions to Your Excellency in order that in surveying the whole field of operations you may consider all the circumstances bearing on the question. Should you determine it is better to divide this army and fall back toward Richmond, I am ready to do so. I, however, see no better plan for the defense of Richmond than that I have proposed. His confidence in his veterans was not at all shaken by the strength of the Army of the Potomac or by the prestige of General Grant. If the flanking movement against Richmond could be successfully met, he said quietly, I have no uneasiness as to the result of the campaign in Virginia. The offensive, if practicable, the defensive, if inevitable, between these courses the government had to decide, and decide not only according to its judgment of the strategic situation but also according to his ability to supply the army. Johnston was still unprepared to take the offensive in the West, the danger to Richmond from the East was increasing, while the threat against Charleston was neither more nor less formidable than before, the commissary could do little for the soldiers and the quartermaster general even less for the horses. Thus circumstanced, the embarrassed administration had to compromise. Longstreet's slow movement from Bristol to Charlottesville was continued to Gordonsville, so that he would be available as a reserve in case of an attack on Richmond from the east. Beauregard was hurried northward with part of his troops and was put in charge of all the forces between the James and the Cape Fear rivers. On the 18th, Lee issued orders to send back all surplus baggage and to prepare for movement at any time, for there seemed no reason to doubt the earlier conclusion that Grant was only waiting for the ground to dry. Hourly thereafter, ears were strained for the opening gun, but on the 25th Lee decided that for some undiscovered reason the enemy's advance was temporarily held up. He regarded this as an advantage to southern arms, because in a few days there would be enough grass to supply the animals temporarily and thereby to make a general concentration possible. Finding the enemy still inactive on the 29th, Lee hurried to Gordonsville and reviewed Longstreet's corps, which, though reduced in numbers and sadly in need of refitting, seemed to have preserved all its old fighting spirit. General Lee must have felt good in getting the welcome extended to him by those who had been lost to him so long, one private wrote. The men hung around him and seemed satisfied to lay their hands on his grey horse or to touch the bridle, or the stirrup, or the old general's leg, anything that Lee had was sacred to us fellows who had just come back. And the general, he could not help from breaking down, tears traced down his cheeks, and he felt that we were again to do his bidding. Returning to Orange, he urged the president to send forward those units of his army that were still in the rear, and then he waited quietly for the enemy to cross the river. When the band of the 26th North Carolina came to serenade him, he took its colonel into his tent and, as he discussed coming operations, expressed only the hope that he could strike the enemy with his center so that he could reinforce his attack from either flank. On the morning of May 2, he climbed once again, and for the last time, to the observation post on Clark's Mountain, and after studying with his glasses the location of the course spread out beneath him and the rolling fields of Culpeper, he told his companions that the enemy's crossing would be at Ely's or at Germana, the fords that led into the wilderness where the ghost of Stonewall Jackson walked. The landscape below him was much as it had been when he had first ascended Clark's Mountain in August, 1862, but the military outlook was far different. Then there had been reserves of men and of food behind him, now there were neither. His it had been in 62 to plan how he would fall upon the foe, now he must exert himself to checkmate the enemy's advance. Yet he knew he could count on the valor of those who, since that August day, had fought the bloodiest battles that ever drenched America. The morale of the army, which had been high throughout the winter, was now at its finest fighting pitch. Never, wrote Colonel Taylor, was, the army, in better trim than now.
There is no overweening confidence, but a calm, firm and positive determination to be victorious, with God's help. The spirit of the army was the spirit of its leader. He was as surely the captain of his soul that day on Clark's Mountain as ever he had been in his life. You must sometimes cast your thoughts on the Army of Northern Virginia, he told one of his young cousins, and never forget it in your prayers. It is preparing for a great struggle, but I pray and trust that the great God, mighty to deliver, will spread over it his almighty arms and drive its enemies before it. And to his son he wrote, Our country demands all our strength, all our energies. To resist the powerful combination now forming against us will require every man at his place. If victorious, we have everything to hope for in the future. If defeated, nothing will be left for us to live for. My whole trust is in God, and I am ready for whatever He may ordain. In that spirit, He came down from the mountain. Chapter 16, Into the Wilderness Again May 4, 5, 1864 At nine o'clock on the morning of May 4, 1864, the flags on the signal station atop Clark's Mountain spelled out the message that was the beginning of the end of the Southern Confederacy, the great sea of tents that had flooded the fields around Culpeper had disappeared, and the enemy was streaming down the road that led by Stevensburg to Germana and Ely's Ford. The campaign that many believed would be decisive was opening at last. As Lee was expecting that the enemy would move at any moment against his right flank, he lost no time in formulating plans or speculating on probabilities. Issuing the usual warning to the army to respect private property, he ordered a P. Hill to leave R. H. Anderson's division to guard the approaches to the Gordonsville Loop of the Virginia Central Railroad, with instructions to rejoin his corps as soon as it was certain that the enemy had disappeared from that front. Ewell was directed to have Ramsar's brigade cover the lower crossings of the Rapidan. The rest of Ewell's and Hill's corps, Lee promptly ordered eastward to meet the enemy's advance. Longstreet, who had one division at Mechanicsville, five miles south of Gordonsville, and a second division north of Gordonsville, was told to start at once and to move to Todd's Tavern, where he could form the Confederate right. General Bragg was urged to return Longstreet's division immediately. This division was Pickett's, then on duty around Richmond. When the feeble wagons had been packed with the scant baggage and the still scanter supplies of the army, Lee started along the familiar plank road with Hill's Corps. Ewell took the parallel route of the turnpike or Old Stone Road nearer the Rapidan. The ranks of neither corps were full. With Anderson left behind, Hill had only two divisions, though both were somewhat larger than most of those in the army. Together, they numbered around 14,500 muskets. Ewell lacked no complete division but had two brigades and one regiment on detached service in addition to Ramsar's brigade. The Second Corps consequently had on the march about 13,500 infantry. Besides these 28,000 men, Lee had in the two corps perhaps 4,000 artillery. In scattered units over a large territory, he could count about 8,400 cavalry, though it was questionable whether the horses could stand the strain of open campaigning. In case he met the enemy's main force before the arrival of Longstreet or Anderson, he would have only three full divisions of infantry, Hates, Wilcoxes, and Johnsons, and parts of two others, Rhodeses and Earlies. When Longstreet came up and Anderson rejoined, Lee would muster of all arms between 61,000 and 65,000, with 213 guns. In discipline and experience, the combat force was better than it had ever been. Sickness was negligible, despite the fact that the rations barely sufficed to sustain life. In leadership, it very different from the army that had fought at Chancellorsville or at Gettysburg. Both Longstreet's divisions were led by men who had never served in that capacity under Lee, at the head of McClaws's old troops was Brigadier General J. B. Kershaw of South Carolina, an able soldier, and over Hood's division was Major General Charles Field. This officer was to acquit himself creditably, though he lacked the tremendous driving force that had distinguished Hood, now commanding a corps under Johnston. Three of Kershaw's brigadiers were new, as were two of Field's. In the Second Corps, the three major generals were the same, Early, Johnson, and Rhodes, but four of the brigadiers had risen to that grade since the Gettysburg Campaign. In the Third Corps, Wilcox was about to fight his first major battle as division commander in succession to Pender. The commanders of his brigades were unchanged.
Haight, however, had three brigadiers who had not held like rank at Gettysburg, though two of them had shared in the unhappy affair at Bristow Station. In Anderson's division, there were two new brigade commanders. Most of these recently commissioned general officers were capable men, and if some of them were lacking in experience, Lee had full assurance that their soldiers were not. Lee did not know the strength of the adversary against whom he was advancing. His scouts had reported that the enemy had 75,000 men and would move with 100,000, but Lee did not think Grant's force exceeded 75,000 and he was skeptical concerning the reputed size of the army that was expected to make a flank attack on Richmond while Grant hammered on the line of the Rapidan and Rappahannock. Lee was not certain, either, whether Grant would follow Meade's example and turn southwest toward the Central Railroad after crossing the Rapidan, or would emulate Hooker and march to the southeast, against the line of the Richmond, Fredericksburg and Potomac below Fredericksburg. If Grant moved toward the southwest, Lee could hold his old lines on mine run with a part of his force and maneuver with the rest. Should Grant advance to the southeast, he would have to pass through the wilderness of Spotsylvania. Lee strongly hoped and rather expected that this latter would be his opponent's line of advance. He was conscious of the inferiority both of his numbers and of the weight and range of his artillery. His plan was to catch Grant on the march, where his numerical superiority would mean least. Especially was he anxious to engage the new Union commander in the tangle of the wilderness, where the fine federal ordinance could not be employed. For these reasons, and also because it would be difficult to bring up a sufficient force in time to dispute the crossing of the Rapidan, Lee determined to leave Grant alone until he was on the south side of the river. Then he intended to attack him there, as soon as Longstreet came up. Maturing the details of this plan as he rode forward at the head of Hill's column on the Plank Road, Lee bivouacked in the woods opposite the Rhodes House at Verdiersville, where his headquarters had been during the Mine Run campaign. Haight's division was encamped nearby, and Wilcox was in rear of Haight, having made the long march from a point six miles above Orange Courthouse. Ewell's corps was at Locust Grove, on the Old Stone Road, his advanced units about six miles northeast of Hills. To Lee's campfire in the woods, during the evening, couriers brought many messages, some encouraging and some disquieting. Davis telegraphed that reinforcements were on the way, though the first of them could hardly arrive within less than four days. In another message, the president announced that a federal force had landed at Bermuda 100 on James River, close to the railroad that linked Richmond and Petersburg, a move that Lee had anticipated in previous correspondence with the executive. General Imboden reported that a Union force under General Siegel was advancing up the Shenandoah Valley and was probably moving against Lee's left flank. There was new evidence, also, that General Avril was preparing a raid against the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad. Thus, ere the day was done, Lee was assured that the enemy was simultaneously taking the offensive, as he had expected, in four directions, Grant with the main army overland from the north against Richmond, Butler on the line of the James, Siegel in the Shenandoah Valley, and Avril in the southwest. If Richmond be regarded as Lee's right flank and the valley as his left, he now had to face an attack on the center, on either flank and on one of his lines of communication, that with southwest Virginia and Tennessee. Yet Lee's view was not confused by the minor operations. In a letter written before the receipt of the news of the landing at Bermuda 100, he told the president, It seems to me that the great efforts of the enemy here and in Georgia have begun, and that the necessity of our concentration at both points is immediate and imperative. Grant in Virginia and Sherman in Georgia, these were the adversaries who threatened the life of the Confederacy, and they must be met, Lee reasoned, by abandoning the less important fronts so as to bring together all the troops into two strong armies. To strengthen Johnston, who was opposing Sherman, he had previously urged that troops be drawn temporarily from Mobile and from the army of General Leonidas Polk. He now recommended that Beauregard, who had already been sent to Weldon, be advanced with all available forces to defend Richmond from Butler's attack. Lee did not neglect the valley, but he realized that the Army of Northern Virginia would have to bear the brunt of the major offensive of the enemy in the Old Dominion. While assuming that Grant would seek the initiative, Lee was not disposed to yield it to Grant if he could possibly retain it. Longstreet reported during the evening that he would camp between Faust and Brock's Bridge on the North Anna River, and that he hoped to be at Richard's shop, six miles south of Verdiersville by noon the next day, May 5. On this assurance, Lee determined to attack Grant.
Writing to Ewell at 8 p.m. and instructing him to move early the next morning, Colonel Taylor gave him these further directions in Lee's name, if the enemy moves down the river, he wishes to push on after him. If he comes this way, we will take our old line. The general's desire is to bring him to battle as soon now as possible, as soon, that was, as Longstreet was within supporting distance. In this, Lee acted on his own initiative and judgment, for President Davis had telegraphed him, you can estimate the condition of things here, in Richmond, and decide how far your movements should be influenced thereby. Late in the night of May 4-5, General Stewart advised Lee that the enemy was still in the wilderness. The next morning, when there was no evidence of a federal movement to the southwest, Lee became satisfied that the enemy intended to pass through the gloomy mazes of the wilderness in an effort to turn his right flank. As this was precisely what he most desired, the prospect raised Lee's spirits. Unwound as he was to talk of prospective operations in the presence of his staff, he chatted cheerfully of the situation as he ate his breakfast. Grant, he felt, was throwing away much of the advantage of his superior forces by entangling himself in the wilderness, instead of profiting by Hooker's experience there. Soon the Third Corps was ready to go forward on the plank road. Lee rode at its head with Hill, preceded by Stuart and some of his cavalry. Not long after the column entered the wilderness, Major Campbell Brown of Ewell's staff rode up and reported that the Second Corps was advancing along the old stone road and wished instructions. Lee was anxious to hold the enemy but desirous, of course, that Longstreet should come up before a general engagement began, so he sent back word to Ewell, who was someone ahead of Hill, to regulate his advance by that of the Third Corps. While he did not absolutely forbid Ewell to meet the enemy, he expressed his preference that a major battle should not be precipitated until the arrival of Longstreet. Tramping onward over the route that had been followed in November, the Third Corps passed the somber works along Mine Run and ere long met a detachment of the enemy's cavalry. Stuart galloped off to the right, where Rosser was soon skirmishing with the Federals, and Kirkland's infantry brigade pushed the rest of the Union cavalry back up the road. Shortly after 11 o'clock, there came another message from General Ewell, an important message, from his position, said Ewell, he could see a column of Federals crossing the turnpike by the route from Germana Ford and moving on toward the Orange Plank Road, in a southeasterly direction. This confirmed the observations of the morning and made it certain that the enemy was in the wilderness and was seeking to turn the Confederate right, playing, apparently, into Lee's hand. Ewell was again instructed to conform to Hill's movements and not to bring on a battle, if practicable, until Longstreet arrived. About noon, however, there came from the direction of the old stone road the sound of heavy firing. Hill moved on past Parker's store and brushed aside a cavalry attack on his right flank. At this stage of the advance, the first tactical obstacle was encountered, an obstacle that played a large part in the fighting that followed, the course of the turnpike or old stone road, and that of the plank road were diverging, and the space between them was now so wide that there was no contact between Hill's left on the plank road and Ewell's right on the turnpike. For this reason, Lee could not tell what the firing from Ewell's front indicated, or how the Second Corps was faring in an action that swelled steadily in violence. For two miles, through the scrub growth of the wilderness, Lee rode on ahead of Haight's division, with no enemy in sight. Shortly before three o'clock, he turned aside into a little clearing on the left-hand side of the road. Riding to a grove of trees in an elevated field, whence there was a view down the valley of Wilderness Run, he dismounted with Hill and Stuart to study the ground while awaiting the arrival of the leading division. Nearby was the home of the Widow Tap, destined ere two days were done, to become a sinister name in American military history. Lee was concerned at the separation of the two corps, which apparently he had not anticipated. With Ewell seriously engaged, and the enemy in close proximity to Hill's front, there was manifest danger that Grant would find the gap between Hill's left and Ewell's right. The Federals might then pour into the unguarded area and perhaps might turn the exposed flanks of both corps. As if to confirm this fear, a blue skirmish line deployed in a few minutes from the cover of some old field pines with an easy musket range on the left. Hill remained where he was either from surprise or in the belief that the skirmishers would fall back. Stuart stood up. Lee, rising quickly, hurried off, calling loudly for Colonel Taylor, in order, doubtless, to give instructions for troops to be advanced to drive back the Unionists, 
Had the Federals pressed on, they might have made the richest capture that had fallen to any soldiers in the war, but they were as surprised at meeting Greycoats as the Confederates were at seeing them, and they quickly withdrew without firing a shot. The direction of their advance was ominous, nevertheless. Doubtless other forces were behind them in the gap between Hill and Ewell. As quickly as he could reach him, Lee ordered Wilcox, who was behind Haight, to file off to the left and to establish contact with the right of Ewell's corps. Wilcox had been gone only a short time, and Haight had scarcely been placed across the plank road in line of battle when the Federals attacked furiously down the road and on either side of it. The woods were so thick that the enemy could scarcely be seen at all, but the volume of his fire showed that he was in great strength. Soon Lee realized that Haight's left flank, and perhaps his right, also, might be turned, and that Wilcox might be cut off before he could form junction with Ewell. He determined to recall Wilcox and to form him on Haight's left, for it was better to have a gap between Wilcox's left and Ewell's right than to have Ewell, Wilcox, and Haight all fighting with their flanks in the air. Fortunately, Wilcox had left two brigades behind him to form the right of his line of battle as he extended to the left. These two, Scaleses and McGowans, were at once brought back. Thomas's brigade returned in a short while and was placed on Haight's left, where the enemy threatened to get in rear of the Confederates. Lane was kept for a time in reserve. The enemy's first onslaught was beaten off, largely because of a very gallant counterattack by McGowan, but a second assault followed the first and a third the second. Still the lines held. Slowly, now, but perceptibly, the weight of the enemy's attack began to shift to the Confederate right, whither Wilcox reported he could see large masses of troops moving. Lee reasoned that the Federals might be pulling away from Ewell. This might offer the Second Corps an opportunity of getting on the Federals' right and perhaps of reaching their line of supply from across the Rapidan. A message was sent off to Ewell at 6 p.m. with instructions to make this move if possible. In case Ewell met resistance too heavy to be overcome, Lee planned to turn the Federal left upon the arrival of Longstreet and of R. H. Anderson. As Longstreet's orders were to move to Todd's Tavern, five miles south of the point where Hill was then fighting, Lee sent off Colonel Venable with instructions to Longstreet to change his line of march and to come up in support of Hill along the plank road. By the time these messages were on their way, a fourth and a fifth Federal attack had been made. Both had been repulsed, but they had been delivered with as much vigor as the Federals had ever displayed against the Army of Northern Virginia. Two divisions could not stand indefinitely against a repetition of these assaults. Longstreet must be hurried up to reinforce Hill. For this purpose, Lee sent off Major H. B. McClellan of Stewart's staff to find General Field, whose division was heading Longstreet's advance, and to tell him to speed his march. Night was drawing on when a new fury of fire came to Lee from the extreme right, but this proved to be, in part, from Lane's brigade, which Wilcox had prudently moved to the right to meet a fresh threat there. Lane's, however, was the last brigade that Hill had at his disposal. Just as that grim fact became apparent, word was received from Wilcox, north of the Plank Road, that the enemy was again pushing into the gap between his line and the right of Ewell. Reinforcements must be sent, but whence were they to come? Not a man on the line could be moved, for the pressure was heavy on all, not a unit was an immediate reserve. The only troops not actually engaged were about 125 men of the 5th Alabama Battalion who were guarding the prisoners. As quickly as possible, these Alabamians were hurried to the left of Wilcox. Going in with a yell that must have created a false impression of their numbers, they hurled back the enemy. That was the last infantry attack. Darkness fell, and the firing died away after 8 p.m. The sky was cloudless, but in the heavy woods nothing was visible beyond a radius of a few feet. Prisoners taken during the engagement represented parts of three corps. Hill's estimate was that his 14,500 men had fought 40,000. Ewell now sent a report saying that he, too, had been vigorously assailed. Jones's brigade of Johnson's division had been attacked about noon as it was advancing and had been thrown back on battle, whose ranks had been disorganized. Daniel's brigade had been brought up in support from Rhodes's division, and Gordon, of Early's division, who had been thrust forward, had delivered a brilliant counterattack. The whole corps had then been put in line of battle and had been instructed to throw up earthworks.
the fighting had been so intense that the muskets of Pegram's brigade had become too hot to handle, but the enemy had suspended his attacks, and the Second Corps would be able, Ewell said, to hold its ground. It had been, altogether, a hard day's fighting, with heavy losses. The significant fact was that the Federals had not waited to be attacked but had advanced quickly to challenge the oncoming Confederates. The new Federal commander obviously did not intend to allow the Army of Northern Virginia to take the initiative and to assail him on the march. Still, the enemy had been halted in the wilderness and Grant's plan of moving around the right flank had been disclosed. That was gain. During the afternoon, Lee had considered attacking the next day from his left, but Longstreet and Anderson could come up more quickly on the right than on the left. Besides, there was more ground for maneuvering on the right. If the three divisions due to arrive during the night could get on the federal flank south of the Plank Road, they might be able to roll up the Union line and to throw Grant back against the fords of the Rapidan. And that would be the end of another on to Richmond. As Hill's officers moved about, it became apparent that the lines of Haight and of Wilcox were badly disarranged. Spread through the woods, they were, in the language of Colonel William H. Palmer, Hill's adjutant general, like a worm fence, at every angle. If the men ventured even a short distance in front of their positions to get water, they found themselves among the enemy's pickets. Federals were captured who thought they were still within their own lines. It was desirable, of course, to straighten out the front and to establish entrenchments, but in the black darkness, this was almost impracticable with exhausted troops. The simplest course seemed the safest, to leave the men where they were and to relieve them with Longstreet's corps upon its arrival. That could not be long. Field had doubtless received his orders to hurry on, and he should be up by midnight. Kershaw would follow. So would Anderson. The line could be taken over by comparatively fresh men, that dangerous gap between Hill and Ewell could be filled, and the turning movement could be begun at daylight. So, when Haight and Wilcox asked for orders, Lee bade them remain in position, as they were, with the assurance that they would be relieved by twelve o'clock or soon after. Lee had spent most of the afternoon and evening in the field at the Widow Taps and there he prepared to bivouac only a few hundred yards from the line of Hill's infantry and almost under the guns of Pogue's battalion, which had been brought up to check the Federal advance but had not been employed during the day. He had just sat down to eat his scant supper when Major H. B. McClellan made his report. With suppressed indignation, the cavalryman told how he had gone to Field's camp, as Lee had directed, and had delivered Lee's instructions for Field to move at once to support Hill. Field, he said, had refused to accept the verbal orders and had stated that he was under instructions from General Longstreet to move at 1 a.m. This was serious. Instead of arriving by midnight to relieve Haight and Wilcox, the head of Longstreet's corps would hardly reach the lines until daylight, when the enemy would be astir. Realizing the danger to Haight and Wilcox from a delay in the arrival of Longstreet, Major McClellan volunteered to ride back with written orders, which General Field must perforce obey. But Lee would not have it so. Without the slightest show of impatience at what McClellan considered the insubordination of Field, General Lee explained, No, Major, it is now past ten o'clock, and by the time you could return to General Field and he could put his division in motion, it would be one o'clock, and at that hour he will move. Whatever the risks, they had now to be taken, whether on the front where Hates and Wilcox's weary men waited, or in the gap between Hill and Ewell. And if the dangers of the dawn could be overcome, then the Army of Northern Virginia should show its old offensive power once more and Grant be borne down as Hooker had been in those same grim tangles of the wilderness. Chapter 17 History Fails to Repeat Itself May 6-7, 1864 when Lee learned from Major McClellan that Longstreet could not arrive until nearly daylight on May 6, he did not communicate that fact to Wilcox or to Haight. He probably reasoned that as the First Corps and Anderson of Hill's Corps would come on the ground before the enemy would attack, nothing was to be gained by arousing the apprehension of the tired commanders. Nor did he order the front of the Third Corps fortified, because he intended Longstreet's men, upon their arrival, to take up and to entrench a line that had been drawn early the previous evening a short distance in rear of Wilcox and Haight. At 3.30 a.m., however, Wilcox became alarmed over the non-arrival of the expected reinforcements. He sent a summons to the rear for all the Corps pioneers to come forward and entrench.
Before they could reach the front, day had broken, and by the time they had started felling timber, they were visible to the enemy and were quickly driven from their work. Sunrise found the men of the Third Corps still scattered through the wilderness, with little semblance of a line and with no cover except that afforded by the young trees. At five o'clock, almost with the sun, the Federal infantry opened fire at close range and soon was attacking hotly in front and on both flanks. The Confederates made such resistance as they could, hear good, and their feeble, and contrived for perhaps half an hour to retard the enemy. To their calls for assistance, Lee sent back an urgent appeal that they hold on until Longstreet was at hand. Soon as stragglers began to leave the front, their number multiplied, presently Wilcox's line began to give ground, then it went to pieces, except directly on the road, and men came pouring to the westward. Some were running. Others walked swiftly to the rear with never a look at the enemy. A few loaded and halted and fired and moved on. It was a sudden crisis of a sort the army had never known except at Sharpsburg. The minds of the weary men were in flux. In a minute they might be in a mad panic. One glance showed Lee that the fate of the day and the control of the army were in the balance. Swiftly he ordered Taylor to gallop to Parker's store and to prepare the wagon train for instant retreat in case the corps could not be halted. Then out into the road he hurried to help rally the retreating soldiers. He found himself in the midst of McGowan's South Carolinians who so often had proved their valor. My God, General McGowan, he cried in a loud voice to their commander, is this the splendid brigade of yours running like a flock of geese? General, answered McGowan, these men are not whipped. They only want a place to form, and they will fight as well as they ever did. Still Wilcox's men were rushing down the road and across the fields. A little more and the whole divisional front would be bare. The enemy would sweep on, and what was there to stop him? Only the hope that Longstreet would come up at that moment. If the old luck of the Army of Northern Virginia held, and reinforcements arrived before actual rout began, all would be well. But if Longstreet were delayed much longer, then, here was General Wilcox telling of the break and asking for orders. Longstreet must be here, Lee told him, his voice anxious, and the strain showing plainly now in his face, go bring him up. Wilcox turned and made off. Lee rode back into Mrs. Tapp's field. There were still some Confederates east of the house, though the number was small, wounded men mostly. Should the artillery wait until these troops passed, or should it open now and try to keep off the Federals who were gathering thickly, there were vision ended in that maze of green boughs and blue coats? Not one minute longer, said Hill, could the artillery delay. If it did, the guns would all be captured. Open, then, Colonel Pogue, with your valiant old batteries, give them grape. Pogue's guns were already loaded, the command rang out, twelve belching pieces filled the woods with fire. Another round, and then another, Colonel Pogue, if there's time, the enemy is still two hundred yards away. Around Lee the choking smoke and the excited cannoneers, behind him a wild scene of confusion, officers shouting and waving their sabers, soldiers numbed with exhaustion or with fear, scarcely conscious of the orders given them. A long, agonizing minute of this, and then, through the smoke, twenty or more ragged soldiers running with their muskets in their hands, not to the rear but into the space where Pogue's guns were still vomiting grape. Who are you, my boys? Lee cried out as he saw them gathering. Texas boys, they yelled, their number multiplying every second. The Texans, Hood's Texans, of Longstreet's Corps, just at the right place and at the right moment. After the strain of the dawn, the sight of these grenadier guards of the South was too much for Lee. For once the dignity of the commanding general was shattered, for once his poise was shaken. Hurrah for Texas, he shouted, waving his hat, hurrah for Texas. In rising excitement, he yelled to them to form line of battle at once. As the willing veterans sprang into position, a brigade of them now, he rode to the left of the line. He would lead them in the countercharge. The line started forward. He spurred frantic traveler through an opening in the gun pits and was on the heels of the infantrymen. Then, for the first time they realized what he intended to do. Go back, General Lee, go back, they cried. He paid no heed to them. They began to slacken their pace, we won't go on unless you go back. 
he did not hear them. His face was aflame and his eyes were on the enemy in the front. General Gregg tried to head him off, a tall sergeant seized his bridle rein, nothing stopped him until Colonel Venable arrived. Longstreet was at hand, Venable shouted into the general's ear, had he not better turn aside and give Longstreet his orders? For a moment there was a hard conflict between the impulse of the warrior and the commander's sense of responsibility. Then, like a man coming out of a trance, Lee slowly pulled back his horse, his glare still to the front, he waved his hat to the onrushing Texans and went back to Longstreet, to be told bluntly that he should go farther behind the lines. While Lee had been rallying Hill's men and cheering the Texans, the First Corps had been forming, Kershaw on the right and Field on the left of the Plank Road. The retreating troops of Haight and of Wilcox had reached Longstreet's men just as the First Corps had established its line, but it had opened ranks, had allowed the fugitives to pass through, and then, in perfect order, had begun its advance. As soon as these veterans moved forward, Lee regained his poise. He left Longstreet to direct the counter-movement and busied himself with providing the slight artillery support that could be used in that tangled terrain. Quickly, too, he began reforming Wilcox and Haight on the left of Longstreet. This was not a difficult task, for McGowan's statement proved correct. Most of the troops of the Third Corps retreated only some 300 yards and now were ready to fight again. As soon as they were organized, Lee sent them to fill the gap between their flank on the plank road and Ewell's on the turnpike. Not long after Hill had set off to the northward with his troops, his adjutant general, Colonel William H. Palmer, came galloping back to Lee to report that Hill had found a force of the enemy in the gap between the Second and Third Corps and wished the loan of a brigade of Anderson's division, if Anderson had arrived, in order that he might have enough men to capture the Federals who had ventured so far to the front. Anderson had found Longstreet ahead of him on the plank road and had been compelled to wait until Longstreet had cleared it. Lee had already given orders for Anderson to report to Longstreet and he was loath, now, to detach any part of the division without the knowledge of its temporary chief. Well, said Lee when Palmer asked for the brigade, let's see General Longstreet about it. They rode together through the copses, to the swelling accompaniment of a violent fire on a lengthening front, and reached Longstreet just as Anderson's division was reporting, about 8 a.m. General Hill, said Lee, wants one of Anderson's brigades. Old Pete was in his glory then. His troops were all in position and were advancing faultlessly. He answered with the ease of a confident victor. Certainly, Colonel, he said, addressing himself to Palmer, which one will you take? The leading one, said Palmer, with the inference that all brigades of the Third Corps were equally good. As quickly as he could, Palmer led the troops off, and Lee returned to the field on the left of the road to follow the furious fighting up the plank road. The counterattack of Longstreet's veterans had halted the Federals and now was forcing them back slowly toward temporary works from which they had advanced against Hill earlier in the morning. Kershaw, in particular, having favorable ground on the right of the road, organized a charge, dislodged the enemy, and hurled him back to a second line. These gains were made by sheer valor, for the Federals fought with the magnificent determination that had been observed the previous day. The ground was incredibly difficult. It was bad enough at any time, with its endless mazes of low-spreading pines and its stunted oaks, many of them only an inch or two in diameter, but now, as one witness has put it, almost every bush had a bullet through it, causing these white oak runners to bend down from being top-heavy. These bullets all seemed to go through about the height of a man's waist. In tumbling down, the bushes made almost an impassable barrier. Together with this obstacle, the dead and the dying were so thick that we could not help stepping on them. Through this treacherous tangle, Field and Kershaw continued to press forward, but with heavy casualties. The Texans lost nearly two-thirds of their numbers, and the other brigades suffered heavily. Before ten o'clock, the first stage of the battle was over. The Federal attack on Hill had been beaten off, the enemy on the whole of the Confederate right flank had been driven back beyond the positions he had occupied at the opening of the engagement, the front was momentarily stabilized. What next? Lee had planned the previous evening to turn the Union left south of the Plank Road. It had been with this in view that he had directed the march of Longstreet and of Anderson on his right flank. Doubtless he had communicated his general plan to Old Pete. 
Now, while Lee was still working to effect a junction between Hill and Ewell, General Wofford suggested to Longstreet that he use Anderson and part of his own corps to get on the left flank of the Federals and roll up the line while the rest of the infantry attacked in front. Longstreet was agreeable. General M. L. Smith, the new chief engineer of the army, had reported to Longstreet under Lee's orders and was now sent off to see if there was a route through the woods by which the turning movement could be executed. He had not gone far to the south of the Plank Road when he found the cut of an unfinished railroad from Orange to Fredericksburg, similar in nearly all respects to that which had formed Jackson's line of defense on part of his front at Groveton. This railroad cut was not on the map issued for the campaign and its location was not known, apparently, until Smith came upon it. As soon as General Smith returned, about 10 a.m., Longstreet ordered his adjutant general, Lt. Col. Moxley Sorrell, to conduct three brigades to the railroad cut, under Smith's direction, and to throw them against the enemy's flank which, Smith said, extended only a short distance south of the plank road. Lee was of course surprised and was willing for the maneuver to be made, but as usual, he left the execution entirely to the corps commander. He had completely recovered his composure by this time and had none of the excitement he had displayed when the enemy had broken through Hill's lines. When a courier brought him a message from Anderson and sat on his weary, panting animal after he had delivered the paper, Lee rebuked him sharply, young man, he said, you should have some feeling for your horse, dismount and rest him. Without another word, he reached into the saddlebag on Traveler's back, took out half a buttered biscuit and gave it to the courier's mount. Presently an officer came back from the front of Wilcox's division. Lee quizzed him closely. What was the meaning of the firing in that quarter? Had Wilcox found the right of Ewell's corps? Had the enemy been located in front of the division? When the officer explained that he had seen the wood where Wilcox's flank was said to rest and had observed the glint of the sun on the rifles of the enemy, Lee pondered. He evidently was in doubt as to whether this indicated that the foe was planning to drive a wedge between Ewell and Hill. If so, then obviously a delay in launching the attack against the Federal left might throw the army back on the defensive. To the officer Lee only said, those bullets keep coming this way, but he must have counted the seconds and weighed the minis that continued to fly from the Federal left toward the center. At length, about eleven o'clock, there swelled from the Confederate right the sudden roar of a new attack. Led by Colonel Sorrell, four brigades had moved to the railroad cut and now were advancing northward against the left of Meade's army. Soon the joyful news was received that the enemy's line was being rolled up. Some of the Union brigades were already routed. The victorious Confederates were close to the Plank Road, a general advance of the whole right wing was ordered. Longstreet had sufficient men, five of the brigades at his disposal had not yet gone into action. With their help and that of the troops already in line, Longstreet believed that Grant's army could be hurled back, a broken and confused mass, against the fords of the Rapidan. A triumph, Longstreet thought, akin to that which might have been won the previous year, if Jackson had not fallen, was now awaiting the army. A tragic morning was trending to a glorious noon. And now Longstreet's troops started forward again, some for a new flanking movement, some driving eastward to find the Federals who had retreated from the weakened front along the plank road. Lee hurried over to that highway and hastened toward the battle line, in order to sustain Longstreet's attack with Hill's corps and with the artillery, if the advance carried the army where the guns could be employed. When he reached the front, the eastward advance up the plank road had already carried the troops opposite the point where the four brigades had attacked northward from the railroad cut. The two columns thus formed a right angle. A few units of the flanking column, in fact, had already crossed the plank road. Lee paused to see that some logs were cleared away so that the artillery could pass, Longstreet, confident, almost exuberant, was just setting off with his entourage to follow the wild, cheering troops. If Lee looked after his senior lieutenant, there might have flashed before him, for an instant, the picture of Jackson as he, too, had ridden out of sight into the devouring shadows of that same wilderness, on his way to turn the flank of Hooker. The atmosphere was the same, the atmosphere of victory. McClellan and Pope, Burnside and Hooker, Meade and Grant, all were one when the Army of Northern Virginia got underway. Only an instant for reflection, and then a rattle of small arms up the road, a strong voice frantically crying friends, the sound of maddened horses galloping off, staff officers calling for surgeons, the Confederate troops parallel to the road evidently had fired on their own comrades advancing up it, someone had been hit.
In a few seconds, the evil tidings were passed to Lee. The Aaron Yes were still pursuing. Whenever a decisive victory had been in the making, rain or accident or death had snatched it away. And now, at what had seemed the most hopeful moment in the opening battle of the decisive campaign, Longstreet, the most experienced and the ablest of the surviving Corps leaders, had been wounded. It was the fate of the Confederacy, 27. Colonel Sorrell came quickly to give Lee the facts and to say that Longstreet, coughing blood at every breath, urged Lee to continue the maneuver, which he had entrusted to General Field as ranking division commander of the Corps. Lee paused long enough to make solicitous inquiry about the nature of Longstreet's wound and then he rode up to the temporary commander. He did not take the battle from Field's hands, but remained nearby, where the acting chief of the Corps had the good sense to consult him. It was immediately apparent that the advantage had been pushed to the limit and that Longstreet had been wrong in assuming that he could hurl the enemy back to the Rapidan without disposing his troops anew. My division and some others probably, Field wrote, were perpendicular to the road and in line of battle, whilst all those which had acted as a turning force were in line parallel to the road, and the two were somewhat mixed up. No advance could possibly be made till the troops parallel to the road were placed perpendicular to it, otherwise, as the enemy had fallen back down the road, our right flank would have been exposed to him. Our two bodies being on the road at the same point, one perpendicular and the other about parallel to it, neither could move without interfering with the other. In the wilderness jungle, where the smoke from burning leaves was adding to the confusion, the recall of the flanking column and the drawing of a new line of battle were exasperatingly slow tasks. Meantime, of course, the enemy was recovering from his near panic and was bracing himself in strengthened works along the Brock Road to meet a new assault. When Longstreet's troops were all in position, and the offensive could be renewed, it was 4.15, and the Federals could not be shaken. Finding that nothing further could be achieved on the right, Lee rode over to the left, where, at 5.30 p.m., he found Ewell in consultation with Early and with John B. Gordon, commander of one of Early's brigades. Little had been accomplished all day by the Second Corps, except to beat off a few minor attacks. Cannot something be done on this flank? Lee asked to relieve the pressure upon our right? Ewell and Early had nothing to propose, but Gordon, after listening silently for a few minutes, said that he had found the extreme right of the Federal Army exposed. He had asked permission to attack it but had not been allowed to do so. Early had been arguing against the proposal ever since Gordon had made it before nine o'clock, and now he insisted once more that the enemy's flank was not in the air, that the Nine Corps was in support. At Lee's instance, Gordon explained. He had reconnoitered in person, he said, and had been several miles in the rear of the flank of the opposing force, which was the Sixth Corps. His conviction was fixed that no troops were in support of the weak federal right. On this statement of fact, Lee sided with the brigade commander. His words were few, Gordon wrote at a later time, but his silence and grim looks while the reasons for that long delay were being given, and his prompt order to me to move at once to the attack, revealed his thoughts almost as plainly as words could have done. Gordon immediately went forward with the impetuous ardor of youth, he was not yet thirty-two. Having Robert D. Johnston's brigade in support, he swept a mile of the front of Sedgwick's corps, cut off from the Army of the Potomac temporarily from its base across the Rapidan, and captured some six hundred prisoners. But twilight caught the Confederates on the Union trenches and forced them back, with only their prisoners, their scant booty, and their tale of another lost opportunity. If Lee had elected that day to remain on the left, rather than on the right, where he had projected his turning movement, the attack on Sedgwick's flank might have come in the forenoon instead of close to sunset, and a different record might have been written. As Lee rode glumly back to headquarters at the Tap House, he must have lamented anew that fatal volley in the Battle of Chancellorsville, which had taken the Second Corps from the masterly hands of Jackson, and had led him, in the absence of a better choice, to entrust that magnificent body of fighting men to Ewell. Night now fell on the confused field, yet such a night as even the Army of Northern Virginia, in all its desperate adventures, had rarely known before. The woods were now on fire in many places. Distant flames cast weird shadows. Choking smoke was everywhere. And from the thickets came the cries of the wounded, frantic lest the flames reach them ere the litter-bearers did. It was war in inferno. The situation, in other respects, was not gloomy.
Lee's casualties during the day had been severe, but, judging from the dead on the ground, those of the Federals had been much heavier. The enemy had attacked with greater ferocity than ever before, but he had been halted in his advance, repulsed on his center, defeated on his left, and roughly handled on his right. In like circumstance, and with losses no greater, Hooker had retreated the previous year, would Grant do so now? Would history repeat itself? Stuart and Fitz Lee reported the Federal cavalry withdrawn, as if concentrating on Charlottesville. That might indicate either a retreat or a movement down the Rappahannock, but the first of these alternatives did not seem probable to Lee. He felt that there was at least one day's more fight in the Army of the Potomac. It would be well to strengthen the southern lines and to invite attack. Then, if the enemy were repulsed, a chance might come to destroy him. The Confederates of the right wing built themselves stout entrenchments during the night of May 6-7 in anticipation of Grant's assaults, and by the morning of the 7th, they had a strong front. But they did not receive their expected reward at dawn. No attack came. In contrast to the roaring desperate action of the preceding day, the forenoon was so quiet that it seemed bewildering. Hours passed with only an exchange of picket fire. Nowhere was there a sign of impending action. More than that, from the extreme left of the Confederate line, General Early reported that the Union troops had abandoned their ground opposite his division and for part of the front of Johnson's command. This was significant news to Lee. It meant that Grant had severed his line of communications via Germana. And that implied, of course, that he was not contemplating a retreat, at least not at that point. History was failing to repeat itself. Grant was not willing to withdraw incontinently across the Rappahannock as Burnside and Hooker had done when they had been defeated. He had, however, to move before he exhausted the supplies in his wagons. If he was about to march, in what direction was Grant going? Obviously, either eastward toward Fredericksburg or southeastward in the direction of Spotsylvania Courthouse. If his purpose was to open a new line of supply, he would logically go to Fredericksburg, but if he intended an advance on Richmond, the direct road to Spotsylvania Courthouse was less than half as long as that by way of Fredericksburg. Besides, Spotsylvania was of strategic importance in the angle between the Richmond, Fredericksburg and Potomac and the Virginia Central Railroad. The place was an excellent approach to Hanover Junction, where the two railroads met. An adversary seeking to drive the Army of Northern Virginia back on Richmond by cutting off its supplies would almost certainly strike for the junction. It was likely, for these reasons, then, though it was not yet certain, that when Grant moved it would be toward Spotsylvania. The Army must be ready to meet him there. As a first step, Lee directed General Pendleton to cut away southward through the forest from the Plank Road to the highway running from Orange Courthouse to Spotsylvania. This would give the Confederates an inner line, roughly parallel to that which the Federals would probably follow. Longstreet's corps, then on the extreme right, would naturally be the first to march over the new route to meet an advance on Spotsylvania. But who was to lead that corps? The news from Longstreet was that his wound in the throat and shoulder would not necessarily be fatal, but, if he escaped Jackson's fate, months would elapse before he could resume his duties. It was no light matter to choose even a temporary successor to the senior corps commander. Three men in the army were entitled by service and ability to be considered for the post, Early, Edward Johnson, and Dick Anderson. In choosing among them, much depended on the preference of the men of the first corps, they must have the chief under whom they would fight best. To ascertain their sentiments, Lee sent for Longstreet's dapper and capable adjutant general, the same Colonel Sorrell who had led the flanking column so brilliantly the previous day. You have been with the Corps since it started as a brigade, Lee said when he had explained the case and should be able to help me. Sorrell answered candidly that Early probably was the ablest of the three under consideration but would certainly be the most unpopular with Longstreet's men. His flings and irritable disposition had left their marks, Sorrel subsequently recorded, and there had been one or two occasions when some ugly feelings had been aroused while operating in concert. And now, Colonel, Lee went on, for my friend Ed, Johnson, he is a splendid fellow. I'll say so, General, but he is quite unknown to the Corps. His reputation is so high that perhaps he would prove all that could be wished, but I think that someone personally known to the Corps would be preferred.
That, of course, brought the conversation around to Dick Anderson. We know him, Sorrell said, and shall be satisfied with him, mindful of the days of victory when Anderson had led a division of the First Corps ere he had been transferred to the Third. Thank you, Colonel, Lee concluded. I have been interested, but Early would make a fine Corps commander. He probably preferred Early, but he could not ignore the consideration Sorrell urged, and later in the day he announced the temporary appointment of Anderson, with Mahone to command Anderson's division. He took pains, however, during the operations that followed, to keep a close eye on Anderson and to give him a measure of direction he never exercised in dealing with the more experienced Corps commanders. After his conference with Sorrell, Lee rode across to the Confederate left. In the company of General Gordon, he went over the scene of that officer's attack on the evening of the 6th and talked with less restraint than usual of the enemy's probable movements. Grant is not going to retreat, he said. He will move his army to Spotsylvania. Gordon had not studied the larger strategy of the campaign and he asked in some surprise if there were any evidence that Grant was moving in the direction of the courthouse. Not at all, not at all, Lee answered, but that is the next point at which the armies will meet, Spotsylvania is now General Grant's best strategic point. Bidding farewell to Gordon, Lee rode back to the right. He examined the line closely as he went and found his men ready and confident. Nowhere was any action in progress more serious than a feeler or a minor demonstration. The news that began by this time to sift in from the outposts was in part contradictory but was rather specific as to the presence of the enemy's cavalry at Todd's Tavern on the road from Grant's position to Spotsylvania Courthouse. During the early afternoon, Lee cautioned Stuart to study the roads in the direction of Spotsylvania, and then, for the second time that day, he rode over to visit General Ewell's lines. Returning, he halted for a conference at Hill's headquarters. While he was there, Colonel Palmer came down from the attic of the house to report that a large park of heavy guns had been set in motion from the opposite hill, where Grant's headquarters were believed to be located. The guns had started toward Confederate right, in the direction of Spotsylvania. Lee, of course, had been studying closely every intelligence report on Grant's probable movements. All day the evidence had been cumulative that his adversary's objective was Spotsylvania. This final item of confirmation proved decisive. Without further inward debate, he sent Anderson orders to withdraw the First Corps from the line after dark and, when it had been rested, to put it in motion for the courthouse. Hill and Ewell were directed to follow Anderson as soon as the situation in their front justified that course. Word somehow reached the men in the works that Grant was on the move and they interpreted this to mean that he had given up hope of taking Richmond by the overland route. Confident and rejoicing, they raised the rebel yell in Anderson's corps and took it up along the whole line. At a given point, one could hear it on the right, then in front and then dying away in the distance on the left. Again the shout arose on the right, again it rushed down upon us from a distance of perhaps two miles, one officer wrote, again we caught it and flung it joyously to the left, where it ceased only when the last post had huzzahed. The effect was beyond expression. It seemed to fill every heart with new life, to inspire every nerve with might never known before. Men seemed fairly convulsed with the fierce enthusiasm, and I believe that if at that instant the advance of the whole army upon Grant could have been ordered, we should have swept him into the very Rappahannock. With the sound of that great demonstration in his ears, Lee sent off Colonel Venable and Colonel Taylor to notify Stuart that Anderson was to move that night to Spotsylvania Courthouse. As the two rode together through the dark forest, they talked of their chieftain and of the new operation he was launching. They had faith that he was right in weakening his front and in marching off two of his eight divisions, but how did he know Grant's purpose? The enemy seemed as strong on the front as he had been since the battle opened, by what process had he concluded that the morning would find the enemy gone? They asked, they pondered, they wondered, but they could not answer. Behind them, undismayed, Longstreet's veterans were waiting, their faces toward the south.